So, all right, this is what we are talking about. And then let me cut back to me and there I am. Uh, so thanks for joining us. We're talking pesticides and analytical testing among other topics uh, with Scott, Sarah, Lydia, Eric, Kevin Jodry uh, is probably gonna come on a little late. Uh, so why don't we uh, kick it off with Scott. Ta talk about uh, kind of when he cross paths with Lydia and, uh, and what her, her area of domain expertise is that, um, that, you, that you respect. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I can't even remember where we first met Lydia, but we've crossed paths a few times at like the Emerald Cup. Um, we've spoken at events that she's also spoken at. Um, there was one particular uh, presentation that Lydia did when where she had her industry counterparts up there and you could tell who was prepared and who wasn't prepared. So I respect that Lydia always prepares <laughs> and, uh, you know, brings the seriousness, which I appreciate, you know. Uh, Sarah and I tried to try to hold a certain level of um, analytical accountability within the industry because I feel that that's a major gap. Um, I just, based on what I've seen of Lydia's work, that she is after the same goal, I'd say. Yes. So that's what I appreciate. So I just, I'm mostly just curious, you know, I know a tiny sprinkling of what she's seen come through that lab. Um, and I'm really fascinated by some of the studies that, that Steep Hill did um, several years back, trying to warn the market of what was coming and how contaminated their environment actually was. So I don't know how much she can talk about what, so I'm sure she knows how to manage that discretion, but um, I'm just kind of interested, like what the regional issues are or what are the common consistent tripping points that everybody seems to be experiencing that nobody wants to talk about. That's the hardest part about our job. Um, so yeah, I'm just mostly interested of, you know, what her world and experience has been of the last couple of years. Well, I'll just, I'll just leave in. So what I've noticed and seen within the industry is I'm sure the exact same thing that you've seen and you were commenting on privately earlier is that, you know, a lot of the products that are OMRI listed, a lot of the, the chemical pesticides that are invited for use by, you know, different state agricultures, you know, different parts of different departments of um, pesticide regulation that, you know, they're not necessarily clean. And so we're having people that, you know, not only are introducing chemicals to an already contaminated environment, but they are unknowingly doing this and it's causing them testing failures and they can't get their product to market, right? Which we all know. And then a few years ago when Steve Hill did their clean clones study, they were driving all up and down the state picking up um, clones from different locations and then testing the leaf tissue for uh, presence of pesticide residues. And they found out that even if you're growing plants up to, you know, a fairly large, you know, fairly large size in vegetative growth and then taking cuttings, you're going to be going through multiple successions, multiple um, generations of cuttings to get to the point where you're actually diluting the amount of pesticide that's in the leaf tissue before it negatively affects your flower on the, you know, on the product end. So what I've seen in cannabis in California specifically is, you know, the presence of those um, really, really persistent chemicals that were used in cut flower greenhouses. You know, we, we all know the, those poor individuals that work in counties that require them to refurbish, reuse old cut flower greenhouses. And, you know, they've got chlorpyrifos, chlordane, all sorts of other, um, other chemicals that are just going to stay around in the soil, going to stay around in their wooden greenhouse that they never place. They don't clean and they can't, you know, paint over. And so we're just, you know, they don't wipe down the fans. You know, th there's such a huge push in the industry normally um, when you get into a new facility is to immediately start going as quickly as you can. And you, we all know that preparation will save you so much stress and anxiety on the back end. So that's kind of what I've seen a lot of. Um, we've also seen different counties where cultivation is not allowed. You know, the industry is really not welcome there, even in California, you know, and 
So there have been low-key studies that we've done in conjunction with groups of growers in different counties to try to prove that the product that they would be bringing to market would be clean. You know, and we, we hear guys that are swearing left and right. They've never used Myclo. They've never used certain types of pesticides that are really common within the industry or really common in uh, agriculture in California in general. Um, and then it comes back that you know, most of them are clean, most of the samples are clean, and some are dirty, some will get hits, you know, and that variation isn't really something that you can take to a city council meeting and say, hey, you know, we're mostly clean, um, because they just don't want to hear it, you know, they're, they're so biased against cannabis already that they're just not going to let it it come forward. So that's what I've been seeing a lot of and uh, helping people figure out where their contamination points are coming from. And, you know, again, testing at the beginning, getting in a good relationship with your lab, understanding what their, you know, LOD, LOQ, instrumentation capacity, analytic capacity is will help you in the long run. Um, is what I've seen since that Emerald Cup 2017 panel with the uh, Department of Pesticide Regulation, Josh Warzer from SD Labs. Eric actually was the one that was running the um, was running the mic, and then Ron Whitehurst at Rincon Vitova, who's spectacular as well. So that's what I see. That's great, fantastic. Our our mics are muted, and we're talking, but they're muted. So it just looks awkward. But essentially what you're saying is there's like 10 other things that can trip up a farmer going to regulated cannabis that, it, that they haven't even heard about yet. Um, everything from wall contamination. I think one of the most interesting things that I heard of is like how persistent some of these compounds are in ducting of air conditioning systems or in drywall. And that when the temperature and the humidity in the cultivation space goes up, they what revolatilize or whatever the word is, they go back into the air, settle on your flowers, and now you fail testing. And you know, I think unfortunately there's so many situations where everybody at the facility is claiming clean, and then someone's sneaking in at 2 a.m. and actually spraying systemic fungicides or other pesticides that like when you start to present these other what sound like far out scenarios of compounds persisting in the air conditioning or in the walls, for example people then think that's more kooky than someone sneaking in at 2 a.m. and just using it or the neighbors using it or something more nefarious, mm -hmm. which I think is interesting to me that less people seem to believe that, that these compounds were persist in the building itself than a neighbor spraying them or a friend brought it in or somebody in the facility is doing it. And that's pretty interesting mentality mindset. So it's funny that you say that because what, you know, we have seen greenhouses, you know, large acre greenhouses that are under glass, you know, that are, that are fairly controlled. I mean, they still have, you know, vents and, and all sorts of, you know, wet walls and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, we've definitely seen, you know, the strawberry grower next door spraying something, the avocado grower, you know, and that there's just a uh, pesticide drift. We've absolutely seen that happen. They've, um, you know, a lot of these places, <clears throat> excuse me, have a 24 hour security, you know, you can't, you gotta have your security system. You gotta have everybody, you know, that works, works for your team. And so they'll watch, and it's actually the, um, the impetus is on the crop duster. It's not on the next door neighbor. It's on the crop duster to know that they are not, you know, spraying in a situation where they're going to be causing an issue with drift. And then I do agree with you that there is a large portion of population that they don't realize what they're spraying and the persistence of the chemical in cannabis because they're reading a label that's not ever been studied for, you know, for cannabis use that, you know, it says pre-harvest interval for this pyrethrin, you're going to have totally no problem. And I, I recently talked to a, a client, um, which is no disrespect to anyone, but I recently talked to a client in a different state that's, you know, more new to the industry. And they were saying that they were having, an, you know, they were going to buy Piganic and that they were going to spray Piganic. And I was like, this is not something that we are doing. And, uh, and then we started having a discussion about, you know, synthetic versus naturally occurring pyrethrins and pyrethroids and what can be used and what can't be used and the differences in the action limits by state and how that affects, the, you know, the cultural knowledge. Because everybody, you know this, we all watched it happen. Everybody was following Colorado. And then it was Washington and Oregon and now it's California and it's like, you know, California is the, we're doing what they always do and hyper controlling everything to what, you know, we have no idea to what benefit or not. Um, but I do find a very small portion of the population 
and you know it and I know it. Once you have a conversation with someone well enough to realize that you're not there to be their hall monitor and you're there to help them figure out what their problem is and, you know, whatever you used to do, it's completely fine as long as we have an honest conversation. I'll often find that people, it's maybe about half and half. Someone sprayed something they didn't realize was either like adulterated or with another pesticide, or they didn't realize it was going to stay around in their plant material and cause it fail. And you normally only have to learn that lesson once, but it's definitely a case where it like does persist in the environment. And these are chemicals that we know that that's the situation because they were, they, the stop sale for them was in the seventies and the eighties. So like, it's not like these chemicals are readily available at a, at a hydro store. And so people aren't, you know, picking up chemicals and going from there. Um, So that's just something to think about too that I've been seeing. And there's, uh, when you were talking about the other state, I thought of in Nevada, when they first started going, they had like a green, yellow, red strategy for different compounds and pesticides. It had like different clearance rate times or what have you. And there was a facility that we were working with that had a um, lead grower make the decision to do pyrethrin bombs on the whole facility at once. And it was the week when pyrethrins went from yellow to red or something like that. It changed one block the same week that, that, you know, they did something that might've worked last week, which now caused a six month facility reset. You know, it was a pretty, pretty wild scenario. I'm just trying to navigate that. I haven't been following along if California is taking a strategy like that, but, um, they're not. Yeah, it's pretty hard and fast. No, no, no. Cal- you know, California, they overregulate and that's how they keep everybody controlled enough so that the law. Anyway, um, it's not what you see happening in Colorado where they come in with like real lax rules because they're trying to get the industry started. And then you see like what happened in Colorado. And then by absolute complete opposite comparison, mm-hmm. you have California, which is like, you know, 64, 66 pesticides. We're looking for, you know, different isomers there, you know, the type of analytical equipment, the, the level to which they're looking, the validation that's required by, by the state for a uh, analytical third party testing laboratory to operate in the legal cannabis space is like more so intense than, you know, ISO accreditations. So the, the level of requirement of repeatability and just the minutia of looking at all of this is so, I mean, it's the same thing as when you're looking for, you know, biologicals and you do broad quality indicator tests and you can't use biofungicides, you know, or you have some issue there as opposed to looking directly only for E. coli, you know, things of that nature is what we're seeing. But, uh, and then again, well, actually something that's being mentioned in the comments right now is that um, once you figure out what the problem is, most people do have a difficulty in cleaning their equipment, whether it's like actually having a difficulty in cleaning it or just cleaning it is difficult right yes so we get residues from there too yeah um somebody's asking that's takes a lot of brain power to listen to you follow along and read the comments on the side i'm like whoa got one eye (laughs) but uh one of the questions is what's a pyrethrin bomb um pyrethrin is a compound found in what the chrysanthemum and then it's in a fogger so like a bed bug bomb from back in the day, we'd go hit the cat and throw it in there like a military guy, you'd pull the cap and the fog comes out. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah. Bed bug. And, and the premise that, oh, sorry, I was gonna say the premise that works behind them is like, you know, when you're spraying a liquid, um, we're talking, you got into droplet size and paint sprayers recently, which I adore. Um, and yeah, so I'm not going to go into that, but you know, when you're using a fogging system, it's those cracks and crevices and all the nooks and crannies. And that's like the cell for a fogging system or a bomb they do. Um, let's, it's a similar kind of premise to burning sulfur, which is illegal, uh, in most cannabis, uh, legally producing states heads up. So yeah, a pyrethrin bomb is just, you know, the, it's a, just like you would do if you were trying to get rid of bed bugs or other types of infestations in your house where, you know, you tarp everything down and you let it go. What you got? Uh, in Southern California. Hey, hey, j- j- just quickly, is pyrethrin the thing that like slices apart the exoskeleton of the, uh, bugs or is that something else? Mm. That's not my area of expertise. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I defer. Um, I think it could be interesting. 
because recently Eric was working in distribution and procurement of trim. I think it could be really interesting to see the patterns that Eric was seeing bounced off of Lydia's same experience with these compounds, because there was like a, like when I was just personally checking in with Eric, there was like almost like a compound of the week. It felt like there was three common compounds that were found in all the problems. And then there seemed to be like regional trends. I'm always fascinated by like, you know, what are the regional detects? Because people just do what their neighbors in their region do. So I don't know if there's any sort of correlation or if it's all across the board or is it like, you know, because I think that should be considered for the Appalachians consideration, myself and terroir, like if we're using pesticides by region, that's a little side digression, but nonetheless, I don't know if Eric's out there um, to comment Can on. Hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, yeah, well, some areas are more contaminated than others, like in Salinas Valley, for instance, um, some of the, there weren't backflow prevention devices that required until about 20 years ago, and chloridane was outlawed 30 years ago, and people still pop for chloridane right now, and so, you know, there's a lot of contamination in regular ag that now is hard to keep out in some of these areas, and RO doesn't always do it, um, and then you have the other pesticide companies where dilution is the solution. And I know one of them, when I was chasing around the trim, there was people in the north and the south popping for malathion. And no one knew where this malathion was coming from. But not too long after that, Oregon, I think it was Oregon Department of Ag or Washington, uh, found a couple neem companies or one neem company with five products that had malathion in it. So a little, it was a little sneaky on that part. But you know, these DTEX and fails come from all sorts of shit. Well, and then you talk about regional pro procurement of clones, right? And if somebody is like spraying their moms and their clone population, I can't tell you how many times I go into a facility and they bring in fresh clones from wherever. And they already have some sort of like very clear virus disease, thrips infestation issue. And like, if I can see disease and pests on your plant, like it's real obvious to me that you came from a dirty environment. Um, and using those more industrial pesticides, especially with the recalls that you were talking about, if anybody's interested, the department, uh, Oregon Department of Ag is amazing. You know, they're really on top of their game about doing the recalls and telling people that their business, you know, what their business is, um, which is really helpful because I'm not even going to bother to name the companies because if anybody Googled it, they could easily find the recalls that the ODA put out. But, you know, I I hear you. I'm sure that that's what you're seeing too, Eric, because everybody listens to what their buddy knows. I mean, that's still a rampant in industry behavior, whether their buddy is a pesticide broker or somebody that they've known for 20 years. Like there's a lot of um, communal knowledge that's shared in the industry. And when a product works, people talk about it. And if it works because it's adulterated, everybody's in trouble. Well, and that's the problem, too, of chasing these aphids. They survive or get stronger with some of this stuff over time. And there's only so many things you can use in cannabis to try to defeat some of these pests. And, and it's getting tougher and tougher uh, to, you know, defeat some of these infestations. When these infestations, especially the aphids, hit, it's like, I mean, it's unbelievable. And uh, I've been seeing on the threads uh, from Instagram that it's pretty heavy up in Humboldt this year. And so it's not like it's just one area safer than another. The nurseries in general create a lot of these so-called problems and uh, they get proliferated throughout these farms. And if the farms don't know what to do about it, um, it just becomes a long battle for the whole season. And you were mentioning last, I uh, watched last week, sir, the week before it was uh, workflow. You know, who's designing these facilities? You know, it's certainly not the people necessarily that are that are paying attention to the, you know, the, the workflow of, of the whole situation. You got your soil or your substrate stored somewhere. It's not in a clean environment. You, you know, you're not regularly disinfecting or, or, you know, cleaning the whole space and then trying, trying to determine like where your problem's coming from when I can just like watch it travel across a whole a whole building. I know you know what that's about. Well, it's hard to realize or it's a tough concept to wrap your head around sometimes because they're so small and they're so tiny and sometimes it's easy to take stuff for granted, but eventually these things, you know, get wings and take flight and stick to all kinds of shit. And so it's really hard to see. And the funny thing is, is that they start out at such a small size. And so 
if you're not going through greenhouses with, um, you know, if somebody isn't really scoping things with just one of these basic little, you know, jeweler scopes or whatever they call it, um, it's, it, you know, our, our eyes just don't see it quick enough. And so you really have to scope, you know, up to 30 or 40 leaves of clones coming in before you actually find a little nymph or whatever they're called. And if you find one of those, you know, it's, it's safe to say that you're in a little bit of trouble. You like, I mean, all it takes is one of those little tiny things to cause a big problem. And so when clones come in, you know, some of the facilities I'm at and, and trying to help or work with it, you know, scoping is, you know, or scouting is a huge part of the deal. And it, it honestly is something that I didn't realize how big of a part of the process um, it really is and how sneaky some of these little bugs are. Because like Scott was saying in the last one too, is the way that they spray, the way that these bugs are able to go tuck themselves up under the underside of the leaf right against the stem material. And so the sprays and the washes and even some of the dips sometimes can pass right over the top of these little buggers. And uh, it's frightening. <laughs> oh yeah, I can completely commiserate that. Um that experience is what a lot of people have. And then additionally, exactly like what you say is the operations that I've seen be most successful are the ones that have an established um, IPM team, you know, integrated pest management. You got somebody that really knows their business, somebody that is, has uh, experience in the type of uh, cultivation that you're doing and also the size, right? Outdoor versus indoor, you know, 5,000 versus multiple acres, 5,000 square feet versus multiple acres. And someone that can really lead a team and educate people to do this work because especially in California, you know, there's a historic agricultural worker community and they're all completely capable of learning new crops if we have people that are competent to teach them new crops. And so once you get into the habit of really scouting and looking around, understanding how to use sticky traps, understanding banker plants and companion plants and trap plants and what's, you know, your, your capacity as a facility and kind of finding your own you know, lockstep, figuring out a way to work it out so that you're not um, wasting too much time, wasting money and, and producing a really, you know, terrible product or something that's just giving you stress and you're losing all your hair constantly <laughs> from the anxiety that you're dealing with. Um, that's, well, people, that's something that I've noticed. Well, and people throw around a lot of what they use or what they use, but not everybody has the same problems across the board at the same levels. And so, there are a few products that are able to use out there, but how you use them, when you use them, how often, and, you know, a lot of farms here, oh, they're using that for this, but what is the level of infestation or what is the level of problems that we're dealing with? And, you know, I just went to a farm today and, you know, was talking to some other people and it's like this rotation of different things that they use, but, um, you know, who can... There's only a few people out there that are quantifying the death rate on some of these things. And it sucks because, you know, Pyganic works really good on aphids, but, uh, but you know, other products like I don't want to, you know, I don't want to say, you know, products and get into it right now, but there's some people oh, really just believe say in it. that I think the aphids drink that shit and get stronger. They're like Popeye with spinach, you know, da, 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 and and unfortunately, you know, I mean, they work good for PM and late harvest rinses and things like that. But to really fight the aphids, like, you know, for instance, you know, unfortunately, pure crop one isn't going to solve your aphid problem. They'll solve a lot of other things, but they're not going to solve the aphid problem um, to throw one product out there. And I'm not throwing it under the bus. I'm just saying don't plant your flag in aphid um, management with um you know, that particular product, let's say, you know, might be good in a rotation, but I wouldn't single it out on that fighting for the aphids only. Um, if I'm, you know, <laughs> hopefully I don't get blasted too hard for that. Well, different modes of action is where it's at. You know, tank mixes is where it's at using surfactants. You know, talking about um, mentioning Scott and talking about the topography of a cannabis plant and all the nooks and crannies and using, you know, using the wrong type of sp sprayer applicator, using something that doesn't have a um, like a mixing tank, like all of that's going to inhibit capacity. I've seen a lot of people um, go from you know, spraying way more often, much more aggressive to using like less chemicals and cleaning up their facility just by using the right sprayer. And frankly, with the cannabis aphid, I mean, a large part of it is sanitation. And I'm not saying that people that have, you know, have the aphid are dirty facilities. 
because that's an overgeneralization, but it is a huge issue that I have noticed there, you know, just like when you release a ton of ladybugs and then they all just die in the crop. It's a very similar looking thing when you have an infestation of uh, cannabis aphid, of bang aphid, there are dead little bodies everywhere. You know, it just looks like soils all over the, um, all over the greenhouse when in fact it's, you know, the dead bodies of bugs. So. Yeah. And, and, and there's a lot of facilities that say they're clean, but they spray every fucking day is something. And that's a problem too, because the plants are stressed. You can tell they're schlacked with oil and it's really hard to see the trichomes or to see the resin rails or, you know, anything coming outside of the plant. You really have to break it open to see, Oh, it's inside, you know, there's, there's, it's going to get you stoned if you get inside there, but from the outside looking in, it's just kind of like, you know, a little oily. So there are people that are clean, but they spray every day. And even though they're clean, their cannabis is kind of like on that mids level from being sprayed every day. You know, you can't, that's the other part of the whole process too, is that the plants can't handle, they might be okay. And I don't know, the word handle is one thing, but, you know, come out of it being top shelf is, is really the, uh, the, the problem. It won't be top shelf if you have to spray every single day, even every other day. Yeah, one of the, um, just wanted to chime in real quick. One of the kind of questions that's being asked, you know, is in regard to other products. And I think what's actually important of what Eric and Lydia and we are saying is that, you know, the cultivator always focuses on the aphid and what compound to use to kill it. And there's five other layers of considerations to keep your, your facility pest free. One of those is cleanliness. One of those is facility flow. I think one of the th common things that we always see is, you know, people are moving into a facility that was not designed for cannabis cultivation. It was a warehouse or an office or something. And then they just chop it up to where they get the most flowering square feet without consideration for flows. Um, how do you actually quarantine something in your facility? Um, the big one you said is bringing in clones. Like, you know, some of these facilities are bringing in so many plants. It's, you need an army to scout them. Even if you're only bringing in a tray, you still need to scout them. But nonetheless, like a lot of the facilities that we go to don't have an actual functional quarantine space or process. They don't have functional divisions in their areas of cultivation. In the event they do have a pest problem, they're not able to isolate it and contain it to control it. Um, and I think that might be what Lydia was talking about, about cleanliness and, you know, all three of us seen the consideration with facility flow, whether we've gone to the homies back door grow or the largest state of the art facility. I mean, I can only think of like, you know, less than five cultivators we've worked with that had like a very diligent flow and facility movement through their building that could even isolate and separate pest and disease problems. Yeah, movement's huge, and uh, and there's a few ways to do you know good scouting besides using the jewelers thing. I mean that's the main thing to look for those aphids, but you know there's simple ways to look for thrips by uh, using a white piece of paper, hold it underneath the plant, and tap the shit out of the plant. And if anything falls on it that's wiggling around, you can easily kind of see where the thrips are. And so I think a lot of people. Uh, uh, avoid or don't do the scouting that needs to be done in first place because it takes a little bit of time and it's kind of exhausting in some ways but if a little bit more of it would be done the forecasting um, to be able to get on top of some of these things and maybe use some of those products that we've mentioned before that would be effective you know if you find it early enough at the smallest stage uh, but that's the whole thing with this process is is being able to uh, set those protocols up and not uh, waiver from them no matter how much of a hurry you are to get those clones out into the field or whatever it is because um, the nurseries are doing that and and uh, I'm starting to believe more and more that the viruses are passed by a lot of these bugs um, even though I think some of the stuff that's been recorded or documented says otherwise there's a couple of people online and then looking at things I just don't see how that bugs you know, with their mouths full of sucking shit and going from one plant to another can't be, you know, uh, passing on a virus. It's just, it's disgusting to think about what they do. And, and, uh, and uh, I think I saw, I mean, I see characteristics of dudding more and more. And I ask farms if they've gotten the test and they say no a lot of times. Um, and I think it's kind of scary to them when I do ask, but I think it's helpful to do the testing no matter what, even if things are looking good. I mean, 
like you say with Scott with soil and water and Sarah, you guys say test, test, test every bed, every, you know, well, water, all these things so we can get a pathway. Um, and it kind of goes for the same thing now with working with all these nurseries and having to get the viroid testing done. I think one of the things that um, we address in IPM protocol is as the, the very first thing we address is the nutritional aspect of the plants. Uh, that is what's going to create the food source, the actual causality of bringing in any pest. And so that's, that's definitely been our number one strategy. Um, of course, you can bring in all these other things, but, and you don't have to necessarily base it on any, you know, the microbiome like we do. You can get sound nutrition, you know, as, as sound as you can get um, based on uh, in hydroponics and things like that, as long as it's, um, you know, nutritionally sound and based in that, that science that supports the plant's health. So that's, that would be number one. That would be the glaring thing that I would say. Um, is is missing from what we've talked about so far. Um, that would be number one. Yeah, but that that just comes from my two cents with a background in in healthcare. I'm always looking at causality, and so I don't like to glaze um, over that portion because for me it's like taking a taking an antibiotic. Well, what caused the issue in the first place? And so that to me is much more um, effective and fascinating so anyway well, just, well yeah and using the beneficial um, pests or bugs to fight a lot of these things can work and actually do a good job um, but it's I'm learning a lot about the ones that chase down the aphid I forget their proper name so I'm not going to bother trying but you know you can only apply certain things um, up until a certain point of flower because those bugs then remain on the flower or cocoons and exoskeletons and now we're starting to see, and Lydia might be able to talk about this more, I'm seeing more labs failing uh, things for filth and foreign material, I think it's called. And it has to do with either too many aphids left over or exoskeletons from the little buggers that go in there and fight it because they're dispersed too late into flowering. Um, a lot of times do, these bugs do leave when they harvest, but there's a considerable amount that can be left behind either from not doing enough work to fight them or fighting them too hard. Um, have you guys dealt with any of that, Lydia, with the filth and foreign material on that end? Um, so California's regulation is, is like a fourth of the material, like a quarter. And so unless it's egregious, you know, most labs are not trying to come after somebody um, for, you know, their product having, you were saying mummified aphids and then the molted skins of the aphids or the, not, you know, exoskeletons of the, of the aphids on um, being found in flowers. So you're talking about chasing, the beneficials chasing, that's a aureus, the, the minute pirate bug. And then, um, but again, those parasitic wasps. So we do see, um, typically it's, a uh, actually it's, it's normally like bud rot you know, bud rot issues are the thing that we have seen being like a really big problem with filth and form materials. And when, yeah, I know that you heavily follow um, the Bureau of Cannabis Control's reasons for fail uh, by week or whatever. And, you know, we still see the that. pesticides are a very, yeah, I know you do. <laughs> still the, see the pesticides are like a very large portion of that, uh, of that problem, um, as opposed to filth and form materials being fairly small. And then what Sarah had said, I completely agree. I actually think that very similar to we don't understand our gut microbiology yet. We don't understand the microbiology, you know, of of the plant, about what's going on in the soil, about what's going on in the on the leaf surfaces, um, about what's happening inside, enough to really be able to understand exactly what necessarily triggers uh, an infestation. Although I know that Scott or that you guys have done a bunch of work over at Crescent Soil to be able to determine, you know, if you're seeing this under your microscope, you're like, you know, this is probably attributing to the certain problem that you're having, which I think that research that you guys put out is fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we, um, what Lydia is referring to is, you know, in, in our work of doing microscope analysis of cannabis soils from the smallest farm to the largest farm, there are very consistent patterns associated with problems. Um, we worked on a specific job that was um, 40,000 square feet, and we had to identify the difference between the plants that had visible mold and the plants that did not have visible mold. And we went through and broke up the facility into zones, and we broke up the zones into zones so that we could, you know, aggregate all the data points. And nonetheless, we spent three months monitoring this property, 
and there was extremely clear lines where mold became visible on the plant and where mold was not visible of plants even right next to each other. And so, you know, we see this time and time and time and time and time again, there are very clear correlations between biological populations in the soil and various pest and disease issues. Um, you know, we have more of a background in the biological side, but as a function of my job, I've had to also become proficient in the mineral side. And, you know, it's less clear because maybe my eye is less sharp, but there's also patterns with nutrient issues. Like we were working with a particular facility that could not get on top of the aphid and then they're running into approved compounds that actually kill the aphids, which is a pretty small list. And, you know, the questions that keep coming back to me are how do I kill this pest? And my response is always, you know, your potassium is three times ideal and the nitrogen is two to four times ideal. And then the questions return back to me are how do I kill this pest and what compound kills um, these aphids? And my response is always like, these numbers are quite atrocious. We need to fix these numbers, but that doesn't really settle on people. And I think it's mostly because they don't have a reference point for that. They have a reference point for using products, but there's not a lot of people that have actually done data and correlated that data. It's a lot of experiential science of, I did this, did this, mixed it together, got a good outcome. There's not a lot of people that are actually doing quantitative data of their nutrient process on any level. And I think that in and of itself can solve most of these issues. Like when your soil is low in calcium or your nutrient reservoir is low in calcium, you're gonna have a pest issue. Um, you know, and, and conversely on the biological side, if there is an imbalance of these soil organisms, you're gonna have a problem. And, you know, we stay far away from, we don't ever recommend compounds. I try to really stay out of that lane. I don't make any suggestions for killing pests. I pull data points of the facility, aggregate the data, try to identify where the imbalance is coming from and work on that. Um, while somebody else determines what to do with the pests and normally, you know, we outrun the pests. We've We've yet to really have a facility that we couldn't get on top of any problem really um, by making those changes and taking that strategy. So, you know, I, and then there's all the other complications like that was touched on on the Oregon Department of Ag. Like they have done an amazing job at identifying what organically approved calm products have a whole bunch of garbage in it. And there's just so many considerations about taking the strategy of reaching for a product to solve a problem because we're now seeing time and time and time and time again that more problems are coming with that product choice. And we need to shift our focus to what is the underlying cause that's leading to this health problem that is bringing this pest as a messenger to imbalance of our process, whether it's you know cleanliness through your facility, whether it's a nutrient issue, whether it's an environmental issue, all of that stuff. It's They're trying to tell you there's an issue, you know? The funny, it's funny because uh, I look at a lot of the stuff you were saying now, or, you know, how you say, you explain that stuff a little uh, differently than I did before, because when I go to facilities, sometimes what you see is a mixed amount of varieties, maybe in one flowering house. And a lot of times people will say certain bugs or certain strains attract bugs more than others. Or they'll be like, man, this, this strain right here sure is in fact, you know, the aphids love the the blue dream or the blackjack or whatever it is but a lot of times those different varieties mixed in that greenhouse are uptaking nutrients differently water it can be the same soil and the same watering regimen but i see all these different plants in there and they all have different needs at different times and some of them simply are on the indica sativa level and the way that they uptake or handle things and it could be maybe you know, the virus or something else has something to do with it, but I'm starting to notice that, yeah, they are on certain strains, but there's more of a reason for that. I don't think it's the Terps they're after, so to speak. Yeah, and crop timing. <laughs> how much time, how much time the, the creatures have to, to infiltrate the system. It's definitely, it's definitely an issue, but you know, I mean, I think that we all see it too, is, uh, the way that they work big ag is the same way that they work big pharma, which is like, let's just put a bandaid on the problem instead of really diving into, you know, managing it on the front end so that the problem never arises. Um, 
<laughs> these these are these uh I, i'm really loving the comments in the group chat um but i was wondering if uh if you if you scott and also you eric if you want to chime in here um i have my own opinion but i would love to hear yours about soilless media one and about rockwell and uh what you see especially in in the conversation about the aphid the canvas aphid that's going all around and like how much worse it is is there a difference between the different growing mediums. Do you all notice this? Because I, I have. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess we'll say like if I think through the clients that we've had active in the last year, whether from casual call-in to full intense, um, we only had one facility that had aphids in a living soil that was difficult to control. Um, they were battling the fact that you know they were essentially trying to do living soil in a soilless media media it was it, it was the, it was the wrong product so um i think that was more to cause for the aphid and then we changed out the soil now it's getting under control but nonetheless um we're seeing it less there i i we do um we work with everybody like i said we try to help everybody move towards sustainability we work with large ag we're working with 30 acres of grape we work with tent pot growers. We work with large commercial cannabis facilities. And I also do work with a certain range of, you know, farms in the hydroponics because a lot of the math is very similar. I don't at all profess to be a Rockwell expert, but if I can help a Rockwell facility be more sustainable, I still think that's a good goal. Um, and one of the things that I noticed in this last year is like on some of the Rockwell, they're starting to get like this weird white mold. And, you know, all the, the photos I get sent to my phone of, hey, bro, what's this kind of go through trends. And this entire last year, I've gotten a whole bunch of like this weird white fuzz on the top of the rock wall saying, what's this? And I mean, you got 20, 25 year old or 20, 25 year rock wall guys seeing something they've never seen before. And, you know, I don't really know what the issues is. Some of them had some heavy metals, but, you know, in those same facilities, they also have an aphid issue. I think one of the consequences of never analyzing anything from a nutrient quantity is you don't measure variations when, when, when they become remarkably ideal and are remarkably skewed from ideal. And, you know, we haven't been measuring a lot of these things. Like we're just recently now measuring the substrate for heavy metals because it's a test issue. So we don't even really know what to compare it to because five years ago, rock wool guys weren't doing heavy metal testing of their rock wool. Um, well, these products have changed over time. The quality of products changes with the supply and demand. Um, you know, a lot of manufacturers on the soil side, or you see this, Scott, one of the things people do is they go for a cheaper cocoa to add to the mix or whatever. And there comes a little bit of a detriment to the whole system when we change something like that up and we compromise the quality or just it comes with a higher salt value or something like that. And so when you get into some of these bigger areas of production everybody goes to the same soil company but they call for their own blend they all call for their own mix or blend or whatever it is and some of them are 50 percent cocoa 50 percent perlite or you know it's crazy you know some of the craziest things that i've heard one facility uses all salts um, and they use no biologicals but when i was here on their soil mix they use earthworm castings and they're trying to get their costs down and the earthworm castings are the most expensive part to their nutrient to their soil mix and i'm like well wait a minute you just you know got got told me that you use salts you don't use biologicals but you got earthworm castings and i'm like what the fuck are we doing like you know so i mean at the end of the day there's not a lot of data driven like what you're saying to that point but also on the salt side of things too is that with the rock will even even if it's not flood and drain and they're using the netafin little pricks that go on the top nobody's really from what i can tell except for a, a select few and i'm learning a lot about it right now and shout out to aaron levy the dude that i'm learning a lot from right now um it, he does big greenhouse stuff and so the drip and drain reports i'm i mean i can't I, I i'm new to this stuff myself but the drip and drain reports tell a lot i mean it tells so much that you can tell on the weekends if people underwater because there's monday through friday crew and then there's the skeleton crews that come in on the weekends that are in charge of also making sure that the facilities are watered and if they're not necessarily conducting drip and drain reports on the weekend to know how much water is being used 
on some of these warmer days, when you come back in on Monday, that drip and drain report tells you a lot in the EC and the leachate reading. And so, uh, I mean, that actually has a lot to do with what's tied up in those systems so that we have um, deficiencies or not. And, you know, Scott and I always joke around about the purple stem pheno because, you know, these plants that are lacking in calcium show purple stems and the more throughout the plant it gets, the more problematic it is. And so the inside joke has always been, oh, is that the purple stem pheno? And a lot of times the <laughs> the growers or the people don't get the joke or because, you know, but I mean, I see a lot of purple stem pheno these days. And I mean, it can be a lack of watering too that people try to conduct as a measure to prevent mold, uh, but it, it creates a whole bunch of other problems. Well, I mean, and unfortunately, um, you know, to one degree or another, we have this we have this great section of the the cannabis cultivation population. You know, these these farmers are really they know their business. They know their growing method. They've got it down at their facility. Uh, hopefully, they have the the proper support from upper management. Hopefully, they have the finances to run the business the way that needs to be run, so that things can be controlled in a way that's you know most advantageous to everybody in the system. Um, and then, you know, again, as we're seeing these, as, as the regulations unfold and we see the new players come in in different states, um, it's highly variable whether or not you're going to get someone that's really educated in cannabis or really educated in, you know, the size of facility and the type of facility, like I was saying earlier, that's going to be able to help you run your business. You know, I've seen people be immensely successful and then, you know, they have a problem and it turns out that they're not cleaning their drip emitters, you know, they're not cleaning their irrigation. And then they have a, some sort of, you know, root borne disease that they're dealing with, or even the aphids, you know, the, the parasitic wasp will go in, will burrow down. And um, as long as they have enough movement and will parasitize and mummify aphids inside of drip emitters, I have photographs. It's disgusting and fascinating. That's at so the same crazy. Time, it's real gross, but it's cool. Um, so if that's their capacity and, you know, nobody's like using uh, any sort of cleaning solution, if they're not using it for the right amount of time, if they're not washing their emitters between, you know, letting things dry between putting them back into new plants, like there's your major problem. Even if you did everything right, like that's a situation that's going to keep you from being successful um, and gaining, you know, a level of control that lets you, you know, really, really do well. <clears throat> Yeah. One thing I'm seeing is like, you know, it was touched on a little bit earlier with Lydia was that, you know, cannabis is essentially coming from a by all means necessary approach. Like nobody was looking, nobody was there. You could do whatever. And I, you know, coming from Southern California during really the peak of the OG era, like I saw some wild shit and, um, you know, most of the cultivation strategies, techniques, and even nutrient formulations have been, propped up by this by all means necessary spray whatever approach and then the other side of it is we have people coming from agriculture that's remarkably unmonitored um and then you have people from the cut flower industry again remarkably unmonitored and so you have all these groups coming in to cultivate cannabis and almost none of those people have been working on a strategy that leads to actual health without a by all means necessary approach and we need to get to the underlying level of the problem, which is the reason why we're battling this aphid so much is because the way we conduct ourselves is conducive to problems. Um, you know, the one, um, like for example, on the one farm that the aphids were out of control, there's a certain value on the mineral nutrient test that we quantified that is correlated to problems. And, you know, they were two to three times the value of, a facility that had root aphids, for example. And so there were, you know, this aphid problem that was biblical that they couldn't get under control. There was an undesirable value on the nutrient test that was two to three times above other problem that we've quantified is what I'm trying to say. And so like one of the reasons why I think this aphid is so problematic and is so um, hard to get under control is because something is driving things that far out of whack. Just quickly, what nutrients were they too high in? Well, so in this particular instance, what I was monitoring was something called exchangeable hydrogen. And again, my background's not in chemistry and I don't have a full 
um, foundational knowledge to really articulate what exactly that means, but essentially it starts to disrupt how calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium occupy the soil particle. And so like a normal healthy soil mix, usually that value is, you know, five or less. Um, where it starts to get elevated is when fish products are used. So if like a fish based compost or a lot of fish hydrolysate was used, um, in every situation of farm we've worked with that did high levels of fish hydrolysate also had elevated levels of exchangeable hydrogen. And so, you know, on that value, like most farms we see, it's under 12. Um, you know, the couple root aphid farms were like 20 to 30. And the biblical aphid farm was like 53. They had a range of like 36 to 53 at their particular farm. And that's like the highest I've seen. And they had an aphid population that was like biblical. Um, and so, you know, I don't have the foundational chemistry knowledge to explain why those fish products lead to this. I just know it disrupts those four main um, cations, which, you know, are important for soil structure and cell development. So I don't know how that correlates to like the salt-based facilities, but, um, you know, nonetheless, the same root issue is there's an extreme discrepancy in mineral balance as correlated to ideal health or at least tolerable levels of pest pressure. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Uh, the, the, uh, there was a comment in there that said, but what about eradication? You know, we're talking about control, control, control. And I don't honestly don't think eradication is, is really, I mean, it, maybe it's possible on the small scale, but eradication, especially if you're bringing in clones from nurseries, you're not doing yourself. The element of human error is still great too. So, I mean, eradication just is really on the bug side of things is really, you know, a tough pill for me to swallow. Whereas control is really, you know, ultimately the name of the game, because if you don't stay in control, that's where things get out of hand. And we can hope for full eradication, but I think that only consists of tissue culture. Like until you tissue culture something, but then again, the plants reintroduced and back into the world. And, you know, it, it's not that it can ever, or a, a tissue culture is the end of all your problems, but it's a way to definitely clean things up and go for a restart on the eradication end of things. But will you stay eradicated? Um, you know, throughout the course of time? I mean, I doubt it. I mean, that's just, this is just how the world works. Yeah, and that's, I think that's still under, there's an underlying mentality issue with eradication. Like you're, you're talking about saying, what can I do to wipe out 300 million years of evolution? Like I'm telling you, like all these little insects are, are perfectly serving a purpose on the planet. Like you're not going to overcome that with a bottled nutrient or a bottled pesticide. Like you have to change the chemistry of the plant to be less desirable as a food source for the pest. And um, back in 2016, we worked for a really large cultivator and got to see some wild stuff. And, um, you know, that particular dude was a wild man. And during that time, broad mites and russet mites were a big problem. And I was working out of some smaller greenhouses that provided moms and clones for the rest of the operation. And he would bring plants in with broad mites and russet mites into this little greenhouse and you know that seemed pretty wild to me and his response would be look everybody else is afraid of these things i'm paying you to understand them so go understand why these pests are here and what was crazy is he would bring plants in in like two and three gallon pots that other people had abandoned usually it was really good genetics that another cultivator like finally threw up their hands so he'd get like this little sickly like two gallon and he would throw it into the greenhouse with all these other plants and the russet mites and broad mites not one single time did they move from those infected plants to his plants? And we would take those plants that were infested with russet mites and broad mites, plant them up into a 30 gallon with soil and put them on his program. And the rest of that plant would grow out of it. Um, some, it wouldn't necessarily turn into a beautiful mom, but we were able to rehabilitate it in a sufficient way that we could clone it and reproduce it. But, you know, through this entire period of like nine months, he would do this and not one time did those bugs move to the other issues. Um, we did have a situation where it was a sealed greenhouse and it got real hot and it became a spider mite issue, but that was a little bit more of an environmental consideration that was creating that problem. And so, you know, that was a really powerful learning 
opportunity for me because for one, somebody was paying me to understand the difference between the russet mite and the broad mite and the healthy plants. But I also got to see like there is a nutritional correlation to the pest or disease issue that that plant is expressing. And if we can change the metabolism of the plant and we can change how the plant is forming cells and making complete proteins and building healthy cell structure from a balanced mineral nutrition, that they can be more resilient to bugs and disease. Um, you know, other people say this, John Kemp speaks about this. Other people say the things that J John Kemp says. And a lot of times like the practical farmer rolls his eyes at these concepts. But the reality is like, you know, I think the best metaphor I've come up with is like us as humans don't look at a gravel, a pile of gravel rocks and say, hmm, that's lunch. Like we know as a human that that's not a food source for us and our body is not equipped to chew the rock and turn it into lunch. But like if nature weathers that rock, turns it into soil and I plant carrots, I can eat the carrot. But that carrot is just the mineral composition of that rock at a different stage of development. It is now a food source for my human body. My teeth are designed to eat that carrot and I can now form nutrition from that. Like pests are the same way. Like powdery mildew has certain nutritional needs and capabilities of digesting plant material. Russet mites have certain abilities to digest plants and plant sap. And so the different pest, I think, is correlated to how out of balance or how broken the cells of that plant are, because then whatever components are in that plant sap are now digestible by that specific plant species. That's a big picture idea though. The, the, you know, we haven't really, we don't talk about that in healthcare. We don't talk about that in, in agriculture. The fact that your plant has the capability of being completely healthy and completely pest-free. So, I mean, I guess we need to start talking about that and as a attainable goal. Um, obviously we have a lot to learn as a community and as a people, but I think it's a definitely a, a valid and worthy goal. Um, but anyway, that's a big picture idea. So we have to wrap our minds around that for sure. Yeah, I think, it, uh, hello, hey. Hey, Kev. Yo, it's a, this is a killer topic because it's a, it's a concept mentally that people have to understand that when the organism is balanced, it wards off issues better. And what we've, what we've done is we've become so dependent on chemical solutions that we use it for ourselves and in plant situations. And for conventional ag, you know, you have a spray that can kill most anything. And so with, with conventional ag, you, you can control in a way differently, but you're also eradicating everything around it and yourself over time. So I, 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 I question the logic, but it's the truth that when the plants are unbalanced, they're vulnerable. And I look at that as unmetabolized nutrition and I, I equate it to plant obesity, like human obesity, where you are carrying too much of something that's desirable by something that wants to eat. And when the plant has adequate epidural level, so the, the, the surface is tough, it can't be chewed. When you get an adequate calcium transport, you're getting cell walls that are turgid and strong. And our approach is to always push the plant, I think, faster than it can, it can take it up because we look at it like it's buffered. So we're blowing the shit out of these things. And you can tell because the lateral growth is supernatural. So we're, we're putting a, a level of nutrient load into the plant to make it do a thing. And if it's not in a vacuum, man, it's a smorgasbord. And, and every bug wants to eat it. And so it's this, it's like a re-education of what we, what we can do and what we can't. And that'll set the real baseline of what's possible in production until we learn how to go past that correctly. Yep, I agree 100%. And I think the people want to know how to fix that problem or how to deal with it. And it's really math. It's a mathematical equation through water testing and soil testing or drip and drain testing and all these things to make sure that you're balancing everything appropriately. Because as Scott has known or pointed out, a lot of the soils nowadays are high in potassium. Um, there's not a total balance in that. And so sometimes we get off track right out the gate. 
Mm -hmm. And if we don't get that balance in, or maybe we're spraying the wrong mineral that's actually adding to the problem. And so it's not about just, you know, adding minerals to in general, but it's about knowing what you're deficient in. And most people know they're deficient in sulfur. That's why you see a lot of people spray sulfur, especially on the OGs in veg to try to uh, prevent that late flower PM and things like that. And Scott lately or over time has been putting, adding the sulfur into the soil, I believe. Correct mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong, Scott. Yeah. But I've been learning a lot about this sulfur spraying too because of the phyto that it creates and the agitation that's needed, especially in the sulfur sprays. And then a lot of people want to spray kelp. And so what I've learned also is that the big guys will mix the sulfur and kelp together and spray it at one time because it also darkens that residue, which lessens the phyto even at good agitation rates. Yeah, what just to comment real quick, what Eric was talking about is I had kind of an aha moment working with a couple OG growers back to back that were growing in soil. And, you know, there's some issues in California now with using sulfur. So like there's a facility down in uh, Los Angeles that we're working with. They're able to use sulfur. Um, but these guys in this particular region were possibly not able to use sulfur. It's kind of confusing the whole thing. But nonetheless, we're running into an, into an issue where people have been reliant on spraying sulfur on the plant to deal with problems. And some people may or may not be able to use that anymore in the regulated space. So there, be, there was a motivation for finding another alternative. And one day I sat down with the soil mineral reports ports from an OG grower and I calculated out how many pounds of um, wettable sulfur they were, they were defining as the need for that crop. So they had a certain amount per week they were spraying. I calculated all that up to figure out how many grams of elemental sulfur they were using throughout a harvest cycle. And then I correlated that to the mineral test into PPMs of what the bare minimum should be. And it, it was really close <laughs> to how much sulfur they felt they need to spray in the course of a harvest cycle to hit the goal was really close to how many PPMs of sulfur should be in the soil have healthy protein formation with calcium. Um, so I started looking at that more a little bit closer, but just a little, little tip. I think, I think there's two things. I think there's a contact kill benefit, but I think a lot of these plants maybe need more sulfur in their diet and we've become dependent on spraying it when we just be feeding it as a nutrient. Yeah, totally. That's the, the sulfur thing is tricky too, because the labeling, there's not a lot of wettable sulfurs that are labeled properly that you can actually use in cannabis with these registered materials because of all the, the lingo. If it says it's not used for ornamentals, this, that, and the other, or I forget what the key word is. Um, there's a couple key phrases that need to be in that list of what it's used for. And so most of the sulfur sprays are not. That's why a lot of counties deem them as not usable in cannabis because it's not labeled right basically it's totally fine to use but you know if people take stuff to the county and go this is what i'm using plus there is use reports that have to be submitted to the county of what you're using so there's a lot of transparency on that end so what people end up doing there's one a product that is labeled properly as a wettable or a sprayable sulfur that i think i think urban grow out of colorado sells it or whatever and i forget the name of the stuff and it's high dollar and so what people do is they leave that in the cabinet for inspection, but then they spray the, you know, what, what most people use in, in the berries and other things is called microthiol disperse. And so the microthiol disperse mixed with kelp, boom, everybody seems to love that. But when the inspection time comes, they throw out the high dollar labeled shit right type of thing or something like that you know it's kind of the thing but you know most people are used to using a lot of those products down there anyway so sulfur is really kind of low on the on the fuck you up totem pole and some of these other big ag areas compared to maybe um, in the triangle where they're really zeroing in on everything and they don't have much other ag going on so this is it and they're going to follow the follow the book basically so it's funny that you say that you mentioned the Opera sulfur uh, that or, or puts out. So that's what it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and I love microbial dispersed. So actually, that's the one that I tell people to use if they have like a russet mite issue. Obviously, there's application um, instructions that go along with that recommendation. But that's a product that I really like. I've seen be extremely successful. Um, 
uh, what I have noticed and what I do think is very interesting within the industry is the formulation of products and then the intention of the product. So if the label or if any of the supporting materials for the label indicate that this is a pesticide, and that's going after something that you have completely different regulations than if we're talking about a nutrient or an additive or like an inoculant. So one of the ways that we were dealing with um, one of the species of root aphid that really popped up in Colorado a few years ago was that, you know, hitting them with Bavaria bassiana, metarhizium, um, paleo, Pacilliomyces, that one gets me, and a couple of other different um, fungi in the root zone. Um, you know, the studies are still out on which one of them is the most effective if in different ratios you have a greater kill rate than another. But, you know, as we all know in the industry, there's a severe lack of research, and then there's also a real lack of um, control that's able to be achieved in greenhouses, indoor facilities, and outdoor to be able to determine what actually works uh, to keep cannabis clean and safe. And so one of the ways that um, Urban Grow privately labeled and got that product through, which um, pretty sure it's uh, Sulfur 6 is a dry flowable that comes out um, of another. It's just they, they relabel it. Um, the product already exists, but the, but the way that they were able to get that product through the Colorado market was that they were saying that it is a nutrient. It's a foliar nutrient spray. And so um, that kind of, you know, the, the people that are running the departments of ag, like, you know, and that are looking into this type of information, like they're smart, you know, they do their job, they know what's going on. But like, if you're able to prove and, and to offer uh, scientific papers that say, hey, uh, feeding the sulfur makes the plant healthier. And because the plant's healthier, it doesn't have russet mites anymore. Um, that's kind of a workaround that a lot of people are, are using in different areas of the industry with varying levels of success. I got to say, Lydia, uh, Scott, Sarah, Kevin, it's an honor to be on here with you motherfucking G's. Like, this shit has got me, I'm like, into this. Like, damn. Like, whew. I love it. Dang. It's next level. <laughs> Bunch of hacks. Yeah. And, and that's, I mean, I, I've always just felt like that's kind of what people are clamoring for is just to listen to, it's like, Scott, I, I think of it as like nutrients and, and microbes and stuff like that. Like Scott, I think of you as someone who like eats books and does research and then you poop out digestible, intelligent, coherent thought bites for the community. Yes. That's, that's actually been my role the entire time. People, <laughs> I think the, uh, Internet and, and, and shockingly, a lot of people don't want to eat your poo, but I've been that <laughs> since day one. So there's no, let's just clarify, there's no feces involved. But no, that's totally what happened. Like, you know, I come from Southern California from a pretty uh, diverse neighborhood. And, you know, some of the homies from high school went really hard on the uh, indoor OG cultivation. And so I used to come along and check it out. And it would be me and like a bunch of homies. And I'd be like, well, why is that happening? And someone would be like, the plants need the proteins, eh? And I'd be like, the plants need the proteins. They're like, the plants need the proteins, eh? And I'm like, why are we doing this? Plants need the proteins. And I'm like, none of you motherfuckers know any reason why we're doing stuff. And so, I uh, no, no disrespect, but like they were doing a great job, but like nobody knew why. And my compulsion and obsession was the why. Like, I, I have to know why I'm doing something if I'm going to tinker with it or else it's not worth my effort. And so and I would it just actually works. Yeah, it has to work. So I just would, you know, try to figure out why something was happening or what was the new, like, what did the nutrient even do? What does nitrogen even do? What does potassium even do? And how do we solve these problems? And that just carrying on that same energy brought me here, I guess, trying to figure out I, problems and digesting complicated. I, science data, yeah. I, I loved learning about the minerals and the spray and the minerals from you and uh, Sam from Soilscape, like that whole mineral additive or doing that and spraying is often like you were doing down at that nursery. Like, I, I mean, I, I, if more people would do that and like even the big facilities, I'd like to somehow like slide that in there, you know, at least I run that final mineral scale. spray. You do? Yeah. 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 I mean, no, Sam had me check it out too. And I needed it for my hill because I have such an aggressive wind that I theorized that I wasn't getting calcium transport adequately through the roots because the environment was so aggressive. And I was just like, you know what? I said, I think I really have to run a foliar program to offset my environmental issues 
And I talked to Sam. He's like, Kev, I got this killer program. I want you to run it. And so I ran it last year. And I mean, the, the, the plants have never looked so good. I had so few issues. It just kept them on point, you know, and it, it is, it's a, it's a gift to be able to be around people who are working on all the fringes. That's why I always love hanging out with you because I'm like, you, you've been touching the, the hoops since before people knew what hoops were. Well, so, so can we stay on this as a, as kind of a coherent topic, which is uh, yeah. sp spraying minerals? Yeah, phylo, the, the, they call it a, I think it was a phyloscape program that Sam had over at um, a Soilscape out of Arcata. And it's just really a good comprehensive mineral nutrient spray program. And what I went into it for is that, you know, my situation is I have such a rough environment up the hill that the finished product is excellent but I never get the growth out of the plants that I wanted because they're working so hard to, to work in that environment. And so I theorized that I needed to go into leaf foliar development so that I could get around having to have the plant go through the metabolic process from the root zone up. And one day, uh, Sam gives me a call and says, Hey, we have this beautiful program coming out. I'd love to talk to you. So I went down the shop. I took a look at an operation that he had been using it on. And the quality of that, it was on an indoor that he was shooting and it was stunning. And so I said, look, let me, let me run it on my hill. So I, I picked the program up and I had the best run last year. And like I said, when I ran those varieties on that white label, there was at least 25 farms that ran the same exact plants that I ran. And I had over of, uh, anyone in California using those varieties. I had the highest uh, terp levels and highest cannabinoid levels. And I had zero problems with the plants growing. And I used beneficial insects in terms of inoculation so that I had um, releases throughout the season so that if I had any problems come in, I would have a, a bank of beneficials to do the job for me because I didn't, I don't like to use any kind of spray, especially in tough environments. Sprays are tough on leaf surface. And if the leaves are going through the beat and they take up on the hill, the plant stresses out because of it. And that foliar program gave me incredible growth. The end product came out beautifully. It came out so good that I picked up enough to do the 18,000 square foot this year. So I'm going to run it a second season because I had such success with that foliar program. I, 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 I believe in it because Scott turned me on to it and I got some clones that had a little spider mites or whatever issue. And the first, you know, like we were talking about earlier, we're really spraying for war all the time. But if more people were spraying for health, they would actually see a better result in the plant health. And secondly, the bugs don't like getting sprayed with just plain water anyway, if you do it every day. And there was a certain point where I was trying to mimic what Scott was doing at a nursery where in the evening time I was spraying like five, six nights a week with a different mineral throughout those whole programs. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't done any soil analysis or water tests. I just said, fuck it, I'm gonna spray minerals and have fun with it. And one of them was just, one of the things he had me spraying was cocoa and aloe. And so, I mean, the plants just loved it and the bugs hated it and they went away. So I never sprayed any type of, uh, you know, pesticide. I just sprayed for mm -hmm. health the whole time and the plants got better. The bugs didn't like it. And it was just this win-win situation. And I feel like that can be done more at scale. It's just hard to implement and get people to jump onto that you know, swallow that pill because we're so forced into the IPM program of actually the war path. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the health has to be part, you know, has to be there too, obviously. But, you know, I think we could make a big turn in some of these, you know, bigger facilities if we could incorporate some more health sprays. Oh, guaranteed. I fully agree. You have to be proactive. And for me, it was every, it was three times a week. So Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And I, I would, either get in at four o'clock in the morning or I could shoot in the evening too. So it had time to, to penetrate in. And it, it made in such a difference that the people who've been up the hill prior and saw the plants using that treatment couldn't believe it because we've always historically had transplant issues in terms of just slower growth. And I know that I'll never get giant plants up there because I have such a wind load all the time that when I run my test crops down low, say at 550 feet at my spot, or I run it up at my farm at, you know, 2,300 feet, I get, you know, two to three times bigger plant down below. Same mix, same media, same operator, same cultivar, only difference environment. So I know that that particular place has an impact on the plant, but when we utilized that foliar nutrition program to 
to just assist with the plant's uptake so it didn't have to work so hard to pull it through the vascular system from blow up, the plants just exploded. And, and my friends that came up and saw it, they were just like, what did you do? And I mean, it was so dramatic. And then the quality of the flower was phenomenal. And when I got that, when I got hit up by the company and they said, hey, they said, you just clean house on your terps and your cannabinoids. And I said, well, nice. So not only was the plant healthy, but because it was healthier, it was able to actually go through its chemical process and generate what we want, which is those desirable chemicals. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, that's what we want, so, without so a doubt. So just quickly, Kevin, you mentioned frequency, which is three times a week. Scott, can you talk about kind of what minerals are in the mixes that you're recommending? And then do those, uh, does, do the, do, do you change it based on different stages of plant growth? Like you'd have different mixes, uh, during the mm -hmm. early stages, veg and so on. Yeah. So, um, I guess to further clarify, the kit that they're talking about is, yeah, it's defined as the Phyloscape. That's the name of the product. And there's like 11 or 12 bottles in the kit, some powders, some liquids, and it's made by Soilscape Solutions out in Arcata, um, which I'm, I, you know, one of the things that I say is like this kit that Sam came out with, I will say, we'll look back in history and say this kit was one of the more dramatic impactors on the organic sector. Um, he assures me that everything in there except for one product is all organic and it's used with amino acids. It does look like chemicals. You know, some of the stuff's blue because copper's blue. And so it does look like chemical nutrients. But I trust I trust Sam that all of them except just the nitrogen phosphate product are organic. Um, but it gives you the flexibility of hydroponics, which is what I like. And so the standard kit has two recipes that you do three times a week and alternate it. Um, that has worked everywhere we've used it. I use the kit in a little bit different way. Um, I personally use it as a toolkit for hitting ideal math numbers. Um, and that does change slightly by the farm. Um, I also don't use every product in the kit um, because we have some other products that I use in substitution. But in essence, what Sam's kit allows me to do is you can formulate a foliar nutrient that has ideal values of almost every main nutrient. And I have not seen anything else that compares to that capability at all. There's nothing on the planet that I think gives you those capabilities. And so we use them everywhere. We use them at the hydroponic farms. We use them at the living soil farms. Um, I think every single commercial farm I work with at least gets a sample kit. Um, and so which is a funny deal. I think it shows how much I believe in that product is that by definition, Sam is an exact competitor of me. We both make soil, we both do consulting, we both do mineral analysis, and we both do biological analysis. And I enjoy that kit so much that I send my competitors to his office to order products. Like, you know, and that's, I think that's more, I think that speaks to Sam as well. You know, I don't feel threatened by him and I trust him and I respect him. So, um, so far, nothing's good from turning our clients to him as well. So, uh, which I think is rare in the industry. You well, know, and shout out to people who make good products that yeah. support this this industry and what we're trying yeah. to do and mm -hmm. achieve. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That that kit's extremely powerful. So, I guess to more clearly define, um, you know, I, I more go for a full fertility approach every chance I get because I'm trying to be simple and scalable. Uh, most farms that hire us have an ultimate goal of allowing to cross state lines, whether that means um, they invest further in their own business and, and go across the states or they find outside investment, they create set, whatever that means to them. Most farms that we work with are ultimately looking to expand and take advantage of the open market or the open borders when that comes in the United States. And in order to do that, you need to have scalable techniques. And so far, most farms that we've worked with, there's you know, one, two or three key components that makes that system work. And you can't scale yourself. You need to scale processes that are repeatable and easy and predictable. And so, you know, we take an extremely simplified approach to cultivation and try to just provide full fertility at each step that we can while monitoring bi biological activity in the soil. And when we do that, then your cultivation experience is actually scalable. 
And so what it's what it starts to do is it, it simplifies the process so that any employee can execute it. And it and we choose process that have really low volatility and really low chances of going haywire so that it keeps it within the, the comfort of health. And then, you know, the way that you can then scale that to multiple properties is that the initial analysis is being moved to a data point. If we take all the data points of a farm, I can sit down and aggregate all the information of multiple facilities and identify where the problems will be. That's the biggest obstacle to scale right now is if your strategy for cultivation is spraying everything three times a week and you keep adding more square footage, how many, you know, at what point does that become the breaking point? And so Sarah and I have learned to take key data points of soil nutrition, um, you know, the nutrition of the feeds and foliar, and then the populations of the organisms in the soil. And by taking a look at those data sets, you can make cl very clear correlations as to where the problems will be, and you can focus those efforts. And then you can either determine, is the reason for the dysfunction a cultural practice, like are employees doing something that's leading to problems, or is there an imbalance problem that we need to correct? And still that allows you to then maintain those one, two, or three key, key em employees that make the facility run, but they can then scale their focus. And I, I, based on what I've seen from, you know, very intensely watching cannabis operations, because even from the first day I went into a cannabis growing facility, I was watching it in extreme interest of how to make it successful. And so I've kind of watched these obstacles of scale. And even in those early black market days of buddies trying to scale, the same problems that my buddies ran into going from a couple houses to a 20,000 square foot building are the same obstacles that every cultivator everywhere is running into. And you, there just becomes a certain point where you can't do everything the way that you've always done it. And that's tripping up anybody that's going up in any scale, whether that's from four to 12 lights or from four facilities to 26 facilities. You know, Sarah and I have, you know, provided advice and consulting to farms with as many as, um, I think the largest group was 26 different properties. Um, and we, ha we have to provide solutions that can be emailed to 26 properties and come up with something that will work. And those same strategies apply to a tent grower. It's the same systemic imbalances that lead to headaches, you know. And that's just moving the ball to prevention, you know, and getting to the cause of things when we talk about these IPM strategies versus um, you know, always chasing your tail and spraying, spraying to kill. We always say spray to hill, not to kill. Um, if you can have, if you can help it at all. Um, yeah. Which is what Eric was talking about. Yeah. Like, and that's what er Eric's really championing that phrase. And that's the thing. It's like, everybody's mindset is what do I do to kill these aphids? And, you know, from our standpoint, now that accountants are involved counting everything about our process, and everything that the cultivator does to determine if it's financially viable. Well, one of those things is sending employees to spray something. And so those employees can either spray a pesticide or like in Kevin's experience, he sprayed a foliar nutrient that led to more terpenes, more potency, more saleability, higher velocity in the market, all those things. Like, you but know, the bugs hate it too. You got to remind them that the bugs mm -hmm. don't like that. They don't want the plant to get healthy and they don't want to get hit <laughs> with water even. Exactly. Yeah, it's like what? what how? How do? Um, how do tornadoes affect reprodu reproduction rates of humans? How do <laughs> hurricanes affect reproduction rates of humans? Like, we can see it in our own life. Like, you know, babies slow down a little bit when there's a major catastrophe and a wave coming over the, the shore. And it's like I can only imagine that the same thing is happening to a bug. Like, if you go in there three, four times a week and spray anything you're at least pissing them off and killing a couple eggs, you know, like you might as well spray something that can increase yield, spray something that can increase health, spray something that can increase quality markers that will um, ease your product selling on the market. You know, Oregon and Washington, all these markets that are completely destroyed by percentage points is really unfortunate, but it's really shown us a lot about our process and what leads to higher numbers because if that's the focus, that's what we're being put to work on. Like, how do we increase potency numbers? Well, you definitely have to decrease aphid problems. That's the first step, you know, and then provide supplement that increases those numbers. 
It's well, it's the overall this, support uh, of the plan. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The nuts of uh, replicating a natural system. You were mentioning it earlier. It's only six plants that are being infested, and you know the bugs are doing their job. You know the insects and the diseases are there to break down that plant material that's not thriving. That's the purpose and point. And that's why those those things occur in the first place, as as we all agree. And so watching watching that develop, and as the industry moves more towards a greater understanding of what's going on on leaf surfaces around roots, you know, understanding how to, um, that the process of, um, you know, individually picking out a specific, you know, endo or ecto mycorrhizal fungi and, and choosing whether or not, you know, your company is able to grow all of that up in a vat and make it into a, you know, a uniform product that people can apply, you know, that's a completely different type of system than understanding the, the minutia of, of being able to figure out your own compost pile, right. And knowing like the conditions of the, the place where you're at and the different materials that you have um, to create, you know, new soil, new materials to be able to feed the plant is sure. Surely it does take longer and surely there are different types of facilities than others. But, you know, if, if you're dealing with plants that are um, not healthy or sick, you know, or they don't have fans, you know, they don't have the right amount of air circulation. There's like a very, there's lots of things going on that can be causing these issues in the first place. And you just want to watch out before they get started. Okay, so I wanna I wanna change gears because we're we're uh, we got a couple more topics to cover. So one of the things I wanted to talk about was um, you know I had like my my mixed martial arts analogy where you know someone's the college wrestler at Ohio State and uh, they get into MMA and you know when it comes to a, a ground game they're amazing but they need to learn how to box they need to learn how to kickbox jujitsu mai tai all these other kind of languages to get in the ring and fight and in growing plants i feel like you know there's not one right way of doing it and people are kind of gravitating towards different languages or methodologies and so, for example, uh, Korean natural farming, and we have our uh, hold on a sec. we have our master Cho. Um, and so, Scott, I was hoping you could kick it off, and I I want to talk about kind of the roots of Korean natural farming in the '50s in Korea. You know, in a specific period and time and geography and how you've seen kind of the cannabis community embrace it, um, you know, here in the US and any issues or concerns you, you have with how you see people applying it practically here in the US? Um, well, <laughs> so, well, I'll, I'll start with the preface. Um, you know, I, I'm a huge advocate of any sustainable strategy. I'm a huge advocate of any regenerative strategy. I'm a huge advocate of anybody that wants to pursue um, low cost, sustainable solutions. Um, and I feel that, you know, I've got some friends that are big into KNF and they've met the Chos and I feel like, you know, they were in essence trying to communicate the same message. I think there's some obstacles with context with KNF that are really problematic in the regulated space, especially. Um, but then there's also some problems with just cultivation in general with some of the KNF for cannabis. One of my biggest obstacles with it is, you know, there's the issue of having enough raw materials within your own property or farm to create your ferments. And most humans are relying on some outside source to provide either the fruit, the vegetables, or the milk, or the sugar, or whatever the inputs are used to make those KNF ferments. And when we work in the cannabis cultivation space and we take flour and we concentrate it into oils, you know, the flour might pass, but the trim's gonna fail and the oil's definitely gonna fail. And so we see phenomenons in other areas of cannabis where we take a large amount of biomass and concentrate it down into in oil or other product and you see pesticides chemicals or compounds that were in that flower that become higher level of detection and so i i i think one of the major obstacles to knf right now is you know sarah and i have worked with large organic farms we, 
we've seen uh, pretty good ideas to the cheating that goes along. And, you know, there's study after study that shows, you know, I, I remember one where they took some produce from outside the United States that was deemed organic. And like of the 12 products, all 12 had something that shouldn't be on it, you know? And so we have a industry-wide issue with contamination. We have an industry-wide issue with unregulated agricultural activities that are using other products that they shouldn't be doing that people in the effort to apply regenerative tactics to the cannabis space are then concentrating these pesticides and applying them to their plant. Um, so I'm kind of curious as to what maybe Lydia has seen in her analytical work. The obstacle with KNF is I suggest these concerns I have to people that do KNF and they go, well, I'm trying to save money. So I'm not going to spend $150 to test for pesticides on my ferments which makes perfect sense. Um, that makes perfect sense, you know? Um, but like I saw one the other day. Um, so I haven't had a can F farm that then sends their, their product in for testing. Cause yeah, it doesn't make sense financially. Um, but like I saw an Instagram the other day, um, where a guy had a bunch of bananas and it had the sticker on it, the PLU sticker, and you could read, could read it very clearly. It was 4011, which is conventional banana. And if there's a nine before it, it's organic. And so dudes fermenting conventional bananas. And, and if you look into how bananas are grown, like they actually take a plastic bag that is infused with pesticides and insecticides. And then as the banana flower starts to shoot shoots, they wrap it in the pesticide and it grows inside of a pesticide bag. Um, because they're so ridden with pests. And so I think there's a, there's a considerable disconnect between the agricultural process, the areas of contamination and how that then affects your plants. Um, and I just, you know, I haven't seen a KNF garden survive more than a couple harvests in the regulated space because of these phenomenons. Um, but that's something that's nobody's talking about. So yeah, there's the issue of pesticides, but there's also the issue of sort of the way that they're using it ecologically and microbially speaking and the balance of that um, is may or may not be uh, scientifically sound as far as results and, and what they what they get with how they use it. Um, and then the um, other issue is in just being able to make the products um, consistently with knowing what that end product, does it have alcohol in it even, mm -hmm. you know, those kinds of things that um, I think if you're using it in um, a commercial space or any, any space that you actually need to sell the product and have a good harvester need that money from the, from the harvest that it would be good to know and get that process down so you know what you're making. Well, that I think that, you know, I come from a business background. Like I, I come from, fan, what you know, what Sarah's saying is that, you know, part of being regenerable and su regenerative and sustainable is that your business needs to be regenerative and sustainable. And so, you know, one of the core components of our business is helping farms stay in business. And so in order for organic or sustainable practices or the regenerative movement um, to be sustainable and have an impact on the market, we need those farms to make it more than three harvests. We need these farms to stay in business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that's been one of my gripes that people, uh, other people in the industry have a large objection to how vocal I'm being, but I don't think people would, uh, people understand where I'm coming from is that, you know, if, if there's bad advice given to farmers that puts farmers out of business, you know, that's not sustainable. And we need to first be a, a business that can make it from harvest to harvest to harvest so that we can stick around so that we can produce products on the market so our voice can be heard so that we can actually make a lasting impact on the market wide. And if all of our farms are going out of business because they're concentrating banana pesticides, like that does not help sustainability. I mean, okay, so well, Go ahead. Yeah, I'm yeah, going yeah. to briefly on it. Uh, so so um, actually, j j just quickly, okay. Lydia, can you kill your video? Because I think your audio is going to come in uh, a little less jerky. There we go. Perfect. Ta-da. OK. So I was just going to say, I mean, there are some tenants that go along with KNF, um, you know, that are similar to permaculture, that are center, uh, similar to regenerative ag is, you know, you're being able to use indigenous microorganisms, not using synthetic herbicides and pesticides, fertilizers. Um, you know, improving your growing environment, creating a more sustainable um, culture, 
as best you possibly can with your facility is going to going to lead you down the proper direction in the long run. Um, but, you know, we see a lot of issue. I mean, if we're not even talking about cultivation, we see an issue, you know, with the sourcing of chocolate and using chocolate for edibles. And then that results in, you know, heavy metals failure or, um, you know, you're talking about Cavendish bananas, you know, how many different types of bananas do they regularly ship around the world? Like, literally three and the Cavendish are the ones that are the most popular. And it's because, you know, we all know the reasons why ag works the way that it does, but um, you know, trusting that the source of the material that you're getting is going to be clean and that you're not um, going to have an issue is uh, poor planning, you know, um, in no offense. It's just not something that, you know, if it were me, even whenever I'm buying or um, recommending that someone purchase a new vat of pesticides, it's like you make sure that you get that material tested in a laboratory against the standards that you are going to be up against as a cultivation facility trying to get your product to market um, because mistakes happen. You know, manufacturing uh, mistakes happen. There are problems where things get adulterated and they're not meant to be, um, even um, without it being the intention of the manufacturer. And so that's just something that, you know, I've seen a lot of. And, you know, as we all know, it's like uh, the horror stories of using mun municipal compost, you know, and, and using that material to start a compost pile. And what you're going to be dealing with is totally different than if all of your materials come um, from your land, which, as Scott was saying, turns into a pretty big sourcing issue. Did, have you guys, when oh, you wait, were- Sorry, sorry, Kevin, go ahead, Kevin. Sorry, start oh, over I, again, I, I Kevin. See, what I'm saying is that I see, the reason why I don't work with KNF is that I don't think I'm qualified at this time where my understanding of using fermentations to drive my plant's direction to me is too risky with this crop at the level that I need to perform. But I know farmers that run KNF operations that are succeeding in terms of their products do pass COA, and they're killer products. But there are also some really dedicated, hard work and driven to understand those methodologies type people. And I think that the reason where you see it fall off is that someone throws that word on top of it, K and F, and autom automatically, oh, it must be, it's better. And so it's, they approach it and they don't understand it. And that's where you start sourcing regular bananas you find out that you don't have enough diversity on your property to do fermentation. So you have to acquire material from somewhere else. And now you're picking up stuff that's covered in, in insecticides, fungicides, whatever, because it's just, it's just ag products. But I, I know people who are successful with it. And the people that I think of that, you know, the top of the food chain with that, which would be like, you know, in, in our world, Chris Trump and the crew that rolls are under Chris, they're, they're growing some fire and they're, they're doing it. But I think that it's way more in depth than people want to admit and that you have to say that there's a level of professionalism in every aspect of what we do as cultivators and you have to kind of define your success and you can have ideas of how other things operate but you have to work with what you're good at and when you start to play a little of this a little of that what Eric said the other day you guys were talking about they were going to do the operation and they were only going to do 10 percent of the operation correctly the rest of the 90 percent of the operation was going to be half ass and we're going to just you know wing it that's the same situation here that just because it's organic doesn't mean it's safe. And just because it's organic doesn't mean it's better. It's just another method of working with it. And I think that when people start to put the buzzwords on, it makes them feel like they're going to do something so like you're competing for who's most organic. And that's not the point. We're trying to deliver a crop to a customer consistently, profitably, and morally. It's kind of like aquaponics. You know what I mean? Aquaponics, you got to have a water scientist on board and that's a whole nother thing. People want to do aquaponics. And I think it's cool. We did it in our office on a small level and fucked around and it was super difficult on that level. So, you know, trying to scale up and I even watch vegetable farmers. I've done a, my wife did a class in Florida with a main aquaponics farm that did it in greenhouses and it's totally impressive, but, and super sustainable, but the level of risk and how hard it is and how you got to be so sharp to do it is unbelievable and i can tell why people don't do it in cannabis i mean it's no, they just get not thumped. yeah steve ray's the good you know uh, uh uh aquaponics steve has the um podcast and stuff you know long dreads dude kid, kid's a fish wizard yeah he's a fish wizard man 
And, but the thing is what he was, you know, what I got from him on the last time we were hanging out was that he has to use like a composite system in order to get the yields that he needs because you can't drive the fertility from the fish end of it safely or the fish end up becoming damaged from too much concentration of ammonium in their tank. So mm -hmm. you end up having a sick fish population if you want to drive the fertility. So they have to use a hybrid system of mineral uh, nutrition in some form of pot that's put into a, the irrigation system where it's aquaponics. So it's not a pure aquaponics system. So you can use aquaponics to drive uh, wheatgrass, but wheatgrass has a far lower uh, value of nutrient load than cannabis does. You know, so every, every one of these systems is incredible if you just admit that they have limitations in specific areas and you address it but people get romanticized with this shit and they, <laughs> they do it's 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 and even they get romanticized with scale too like once i got my venlo i'm gonna be somebody i'm like you're gonna be fucking bankrupt it's that that alone doesn't make you somebody it's just a tool and i think that these organic methodologies as fascinating as they are to me because they are art you have to admit that, like I said, I don't have the ability to ferment everything in my woods and close my loops and do this operation in that way and make money. You know, so I use an organic bottom end and I and I charge it so that I have a, a bacteria base that's solid. So my base level of fertility is consistent and I can get analysis done so I know I'm within range. And then I then I utilize that phyloscape technology to get around the environmental stress. But I just admitted to myself that when I'm 70, maybe then I can be a fully closed loop farmer because I can start to grow all the products that are needed. When I was in Colombia, they were growing all these products that they were using for their ag in general. And once they got into cannabis, they just had to increase the acreage of the things that they were already producing to use as ferments because that's how they operated naturally. So for them, K and F situation made total sense because they were already really following it, but it was more like Colombian natural farming. They weren't copying, you know, Master Cho. They were copying how they've been doing it since the dawn of time. And I think you just have to be really honest about your situation and just say, look, there's a lot of ways to get to the destination. Choose the one that's going to work for you, and it's okay. You're not in competition with each other for who's who's coolest with their with their grow technology. Honesty isn't the first policy in cannabis, it seems. I don't know. <laughs> the ego, ego is the best policy or something it's because policy. either you don't want to, either you don't want to spend shit and show everybody you can grow great weed, or you want to spend everything and show everybody you can grow great weed. There's not a lot of in between. No. <laughs> and the one consistent thing I would say, what the biggest problem with KNF becoming extremely successful is that. Once something becomes popular, people don't want to fall out of that cool click and they don't want to admit it didn't go well. And so everybody just keeps smiling and saying everything's fine, like that meme when the thing's on fire. And because nobody wants to be yeah. nobody wants to be the guy that didn't do it well. And that's yeah. that's systemic across the board, which I keep saying is the number one throttle on evolution of the industry wide. As soon as people can be authentic and honest about how bad things aren't going we can start talking about how good they can go and you know people aren't quite ready we're not big ag like that yet we're just not just it's not enough you know when when shit's going wrong in strawberries everybody's talking about it when shit's going wrong in sugar beets or grapes or any of that i remember when i was a kid they had this weird phenomenon going through sugar beets and it was wiping everybody out and all the farmers all the you know companies everybody rallies around this shit to fix it and figure out what the problem is and kind of do a reset and it's just we're not in that category as much as that's the part of big ag we should be in everybody mm -hmm. really gets together and really does these things and some of these people um, share these trials that are being done i know a guy that's really i mean he's a big ag guy moved into cannabis and he loves cannabis so it's a great uh, way of looking at it. it wasn't a big ag guy trying to get in it for the money he was already in big ag wanted to be into cannabis and bring what he knew and learn what he can and so basically you know I actually was talking to Peter about this guy and saying we should get him on the podcast and I talked to him about it the other day and he was like fuck no I can't go on there the company I work for won't let me talk to anybody about shit you know and I was just like well that's you know fuck you know and he would be great and 
you know, I've learned a lot and uh, things like that. But if it's not the company itself, well, it is, it's the company itself holding back even good people within that company to share that information. So, I mean, it's kind of crazy how, how bottled up it is or the, well, so, so just quickly, uh, sticking on our, our uh, KNF topic, uh, Chris Trump's actually confirmed for next week. Um, nice. So, Scott, just quickly, can you touch on uh, the use of rice uh, to kind of to collect uh, and, and grow things? Uh, mm -hmm. You had mentioned something about rice and kind of concerns there. And then also kind of how Master Cho, from your perspective, has evolved uh, his way of thinking and, and what, how he thinks about things differently. And now we're going to get on to Elaine Ingham and, and the soil food web. Yeah. I, I think, you know, one, one of the things that I think is really missing from the KNF community is a little bit more solid foundation of the entirety of the soil food web and how these things interplay in the root system of plants and lead to good results or bad results. Um, you know, one of the objections that Dr. Lane Ingeman has had is the concept that we're taking a strategy from Korea using rice, which is something that naturally exists in that region. They're using it to catch organisms and using that to be their inoculum, uh, which, I think Kevin nailed it. Like they're doing Columbia natural farming. Like, okay, so those Colombians have adapted these same principles of using the available materials in their environment to compost them or ferment them down that they can then use for healthy plant growth. And I think that's something that's being missed in the United States. And so when we take rice, which is something that doesn't naturally occur in the forest of the redwoods, and we put it into the root system or soil or mulch layer, or whatever it is they're doing with it, they're harvesting organisms from that environment that are suitable to decomposing that material, not necessarily organisms that lead to healthy plant growth within that environment. And, um, you know, the, the KNF community just objects to my objection and nobody really, you know, opens a textbook to even see what they're doing or, you know, takes Dr. Lane's microscope course, which again is contradictory to the KNF principles of being low cost. So we just have this kind of obstacle where, um, you know, the entire KNF community from my standpoint is neglecting a major portion of soil biology that's easily and readily found in textbooks that you can read up on and understand how these systems work, what these organisms do, and how they do or do not positively affect plant growth. Um, they're kind of in the wizardry side, which I'm down for wizardry, but you can't live on wizardry and deny the law of gravity, you know? Well, even uh, the tea brewers have a little wizardry too, a little <laughs> sprinkle of this and a sprinkle of that. So, I mean, everybody mm -hmm. gets their wizard hat on sometimes, but yeah. sure. I, I'm, you're definitely going to break the internet on this one, Scott. You might have to unblock some people or something. I don't even do, I don't even do, <laughs> I don't even, I don't belong to the internet anymore. It doesn't. I know, fuck, you, you got to get back on. No, I don't belong to the internet. I come from, I come from Southern California and I was raised by skaters, surfers, and gangsters where it wasn't real, to, it wasn't okay to be fake. Like you got called fake every day if like you didn't drop in on the ramp properly. Like, and so I'm not going to participate in Instagram. It's just like, it's like the bar scene of fake asses. Like, I'm not trying to participate in that shit. Like, yeah, I'm, like I don't even, I don't got post COVID. I got no time for this shit. I got no time for this <laughs> shit. None. All right. So, so, ju so just quickly, gi give me uh, your perspective, like on, on ferments and alcohol and, and master chose evolved thinking and water. Uh, can you and go? Well, I guess so. I what so what, Peter, I guess to catch up the live listener, um, <laughs> I'm, I don't I don't at all want to speak for the shows um, necessarily. But to my understanding, like the evolution of KNF has even been to like the Jadam or Jadam, which is his son, which to my understanding that's been communicated to me by KNF people, it's more of a water-based ferment. And so I was kind of shocked to hear that the people here in the United States trying to grow cannabis are doing like sugar-based ferments, which leads to a lot of alcohols. And it seems that the Cho family themselves are evolving to a water-based ferment. And, you know, I don't 
know the intricacies of that. But what I do see is an evolution from the Cho family on their own process. And so we need to say that same evolution within the cannabis space of their process, because, you know, my wife and I's job is as a lab and we were trained by a scientist to identify organisms, whether you're a KNF garden or a living soil garden, when we do this analysis and put these organisms into different categories, it's very clear indicator of success or bad outcome, regardless of the type of farm you're at. And, um, you know, there's these phenomena in the root zone that are very important. I was trying to dig through it last night, but we got so many damn textbooks at this house, I couldn't find it. Um, but there was this one, <laughs> we were both flipping through books like, like where's this quote? If you're gonna quote science, you gotta be accurate or else they rip you to shreds on the internet. But nonetheless, um, this whole paragraph was speaking about all the functions of plants that stop under an anaerobic condition in the root zone. And this is important because major metabolic functions stop working under decreased oxygen conditions and a whole bunch of other compounds are produced. And, you know, so we run this lab where people send us soil samples from the smallest garden to the biggest garden, living soil, non-living soil, hybrid, KNF, we get a lot of it. And by far the weirdest plant sy symptoms come from the KNF sector. Like nobody that's doing a living soil farm calls me because their stem turned to gush and the plant fell over. Like nobody in hydroponics has ever called me like that. Um, you know, there's some really, really weird plant phenomenon that are happening. And I believe it has something to do with the horrendous amount of alcohol that are being poured on the plants. Yeah, I'm going to second that. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's because I like, I think what happens is the internet starts to rebut me saying that I'm saying everybody needs to be on my camp. And that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is if you're going to engage in organic activities and talk about biological concepts, you should familiarize yourself with these functions and foundations from readily accessible textbooks in the library. Like it's not just my information, like there's major complications with the strategy. And I'm not saying it can't be done because we've assisted some farmers that have had some pretty good success with a hybrid approach. Um, and there's definitely an increase in terpenes. There's definitely an increase that comes with using some of these KNF functions. Um, but you cannot ignore foundations of biological concepts that are just as absolute as the law of gravity. So that's my two cents. We would just say, you know, what, what to echo kind of what Lydia and what um, Kevin was saying, um, just whatever you're going to do, whatever system you resonate with, just make sure you take the time to quantify what it is you're doing so you know why you're doing it and you don't waste that effort only to find at the end of the harvest that you failed for whatever pesticide that you didn't see coming down the pipe because you overlooked something. And that happens to all of us. That happened, That's a major learning lesson for everyone. We're all in a great big learning lesson right now on that. But just quantify what you're doing. It, it Take the time, spend the money to do it. Otherwise, you know, at the end of it, you could you know, definitely miss something and, and mm -hmm. fail testing and yeah. not get that money. Yeah. So you, just, you don't fail testing. You just, you have an off crop. Right. If the product isn't right, it doesn't have a home anymore. That's right. Yeah. yeah. The low yeah. shelf. So Which is what mm -hmm. I know. And that gives me the right production at that location. And so I think that direction always has to be specific where, you know, it's in terms of scalability, I never intend to scale that operation. That is always meant to be the size it is. And I'm cool with that for its duration. So I can use that as a specific, but anytime you go to any operation, you know, you have to identify the people have the ability first to even run and do what they intend to run and do. And I just think that there's people who are brilliant and they know how to make these systems work. And then there's shortcuts that occur because people don't understand that, that that isn't a shortcut, that if you do this, you will get this problem as a result. And there hasn't been enough experience in the US for operators. I would it'd be interesting to go to Korea and see people farm and ask them, you know, do you use KNF? And what, like, how do they approach farming in their culture? Because that's what I get kind of caught up in is how, does the, how do the people in these, these other countries that don't have 
commercial ag to the same degree we do in the way we approach it, how do they generate the products? That was what was so interesting about the Colombian situation was they were scaling out the crops that they were going to grow to create the products they needed. So they had full control of what they did as an input and they knew exactly why I asked them, why, why do you grow this? And he said, this is what we get from this. This is what we get from that. So they had a full strategy and had been based off of success. It's just that like for me, my farm isn't, isn't developed to that degree yet. But the people that I know that are having success, when you go to their properties, it's almost like a plant oasis to where they have so many different things growing in such a balance that they can create these balanced systems. And, you know, and I, I strive for that as my long-term goal, but I know that I can't jump right into it and succeed. It's too much of a risk. It has to be a progression. You know, like we talked about last time, you start off with something, you prove the concept, you increase it exponentially until you've reached for, you know, the full max potential. But if, if, you're just, if you're just moving through time and space, running as fast as you can, you can run right into a fucking wall. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and our okay, core message is we're, we're trying to keep these regenerative farms in business. That's the thing. Like, mm -hmm. you know, Kevin's taken the strategy he is because he knows it ensures his survival in the market. Like we're trying to keep all these people in business so that we can make a broader impact. You know, if we have all of our organic farms go out of business because they planted in a first year hugel culture, like that ain't, that's not sustainable. Like we need to, we need to develop systems that are actually repeatable, that actually lead to sustainability of your business. And that's, that's why I like Kevin so much. He's got a you know business mindset. I came from a business family as well. So yeah, I'm on the regenerative camp, but I'm always looking at from a small business survivability standpoint. Quantifying like we, we have to start with being successful and repeating that. That's yep. where sustainability starts for me. You know, and I, a lot of times I see farms make it to the commercial scale and a lot of them have hired us to help them and they go so far to the regenerative that it's not practical for their survivability in the market. And we have to start with survivability in the market and inch our way towards full sustainability of our property. Or it's just going to be a boneyard of stories of what almost was, you know, because I can tell you the hydro facilities, they're not slowing down. They're ramping up. And, you know, unless some of these regenerative farms figure out how to be profitable to make an impact on the market or how we community wide figure out how to communicate strategies that lead to regenerative opportunities and sustainability, you know, what impact are we actually going to have and how do we actually get there? So, yeah. If it, oh, go ahead, Peter. What, if you have one last comment, because I was going to change topics. So go ahead. No, change the topic. I, I we could probably go all day. Okay, so so, so, <laughs> so I, I I'm gonna get my uh, I'm gonna get a religious reference in. Uh, so talking about Elaine Ingham, Soil Food Web, uh, there are a lot of Elaine disciples uh, in this conversation today. But we, like, if I think of Christianity, there are a lot of forks, right? Like you had Catholicism and then you had the Protestant Reformation where, you know, we agree with 99% of Catholicism, but we disagree with this one thing and we're going to go down our own path. So can you all talk from your own perspectives, kind of where you have a different philosophy, where your philosophies are slightly or very different than Elaine's, like so, some of the differences between how you see her approaching things and and your personal approaches well i guess i guess to tie it into your religious thing is within the agricultural sector people are as devout as religious people are and you know each religion lives and dies by their uniqueness um and and nonetheless so we're i think we're personally in a stage where we're kind of going from this um you know, religious approach where it's us against them. It's, you know, you're seeing this mineral analysis against um, biological analysis. Like Sarah went to the Bionutrient Food Con Convention last year and met up with Todd Harrington, another big soul food web guy from the East Coast. And they went and talked to John Kemp and introduced himself. And in that next segment, John Kemp is talking about how you don't need to measure soil organism populations, you know, and it's just, Elaine kind of does this thing. I love and adore Elaine. I would not be here without her, but she responds in kind with all you need is biology. And 
I think where we're unique is that we incorporate everything. I come from a very qualified group of um, hydroponic cultivators in Southern California. I absolutely take that into my living soil strategies. Um, you know, and so you cannot. Yeah, you just know, quickly, what, what are some of the things you, you've adopted from the hydro community? Uh, it's the mentality. Um, you know, growing up in Southern California, like, like you couldn't, you couldn't be fake about it. Like you had to actually do it or you had to completely be quiet. And so in the organic sector, it's much more important to be the guru, know the guru or regurgitate the guru than actually be good at growing pot. And that's the biggest disabled aspect of the organic sector is it's much cooler to be like, you can cut down three quarters of your garden each year and you still be a guru. Like that's insane to me from my hydroponic background. Like you had to be good or nobody even listened to a word you said. And so I've taken that mentality and tried to be as regenerative as possible. And, um, you know, you know, just take a holistic approach. Sarah comes from medicine. My family's in medicine. I was raised in a hospital with my single mom. I spent a lot of time sitting in a, a nurse management office listening to um, patient information prior to the HIPAA consideration, <laughs> nonetheless. But, um, you know, we take a holistic approach. We take a science-based mathematical approach so that I can approach it without emotions and I can make a quantified decision that leads to a result that's either predictable or unexpected, but at least measured so that we can come to a result that can be repeated. Um, so Elaine is biology only, the mineral people are mineral only, and we do as full effort on every aspect as we can, and then we foliar feed like we're doing hydroponics. Holistic biology. Yeah, and yeah. So, so what happens is as there's a disruption in one component of the system, so like, in organics or living soil, the soil minerality moves at such a slow pace that if you're correcting a mineral imbalance, you might take two or three harvests to get that under control. You need to balance that with your soil feeds or your foliar feeds. And that's why all these water only people either don't do water only or they fail saying water only is because the soil moves so slow. You have to, you have to correct to the context of the situation with soil feeds or foliar feeds while using the biological population as an indicator. The main anchor of what we do is making sure that nothing we do reduces biological populations. And I think that's what makes Sarah and I actually unique is that lots of people say biology, everybody says soil food web, they all hashtag it, but like by what measure are you doing any of these things? And we govern all decisions based on what my wife measures through the microscope. If something I come up with that I think is a good idea wipes out populations, it obviously was not a good idea from a biological standpoint because we harmed the most sensitive biological members in the system. And so it might still lead to a yield, but if you're compromising soil organisms, you're also compromising plant health because it is also a biological system. Yeah. And I would say just to kind of um, touch on your your um, religious little opening there is that um, you know the first law of chaos is that the truth is different for everyone and that's the beauty of science is that science can unify us on what we can all you know achieve if we adhere to certain principles whether you're KNF whether you're soil food web whether you're um, hydro anything there's certain principles that underlie biological systems and so that's all we're trying to say is just quantify it know what you're doing and and integrate that into your IPM strategy as your number one thing you do is get that system in place that you know what you're doing nutritionally to support that plant and if there's something that's been going wrong a messenger being sent to you via a bug or a, a disease then you start looking okay where 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 is the crack in the system? What are, you know, is it nutritionally based? Are we pretty sound there? Do we need to do more analytics there? Do we, do we um, look at, like Lydia was saying, do we need to, we're seeing a certain pathogen? Do we need to look at our water system? Are we cleaning that enough? Just those kinds of sound principles, but just to wrap that all in mm -hmm. anyway. The, the only real issue that, you know, Elaine and I, because I respect the shit out of her. I think she's a brilliant woman, but and, and she came to me to speak to me about, remember we had talked about driving those uh, viruses out of those plants using the earth boxes. And so she was fascinated because it, that's anaerobically driven using lactic acid and sub-irrigation. 
And so what we came to was that what's the definition of aerobic? Because really it's a certain parts per million of oxygen present. And so in this gray area of interpretation, there was which method is it considered an anaerobic delivery or an aerobic delivery? And that's where, like my mom was a scientist and she's brilliant, but she always made sure I remembered that you used to be burned alive because the, the sun rotated around the earth. And if you didn't say that, they're crucified. And that was pretty current science at the time. And so she always kind of let me understand that we only see snapshots and we know as much as we can right now and we have to work with that. And it doesn't mean that we don't know, but it means that's our limit of understanding. And I think when you, you get into this religious dogma, what happens is you start to take away reason and you just yeah. follow blindly. And what you need to be able to do is take the, the, the education from the individual and understand how to apply it. And if other people are having success with contrary methods, you need to investigate and try to find out what is the common success of all methods because something is occurring that's succeeding. Yes. And so I think that, you know, with what we're all trying to do is, is understand there's an art and a science we're trying to merge and we only know so much about either. And I think that's where Dr. Ingham gets jammed is because I don't think she could be any smarter at what she is. I mean, she's, if you've spent some time with her, man, she's brilliant and she's got such a nice rhythm with it that it's, she lives that shit, mm -hmm. but that's what she knows. And then when you run something that you don't have the same understanding, but it's doing something, it can't be wrong. And so it's really trying to bring everyone into the same area to say, hey, look, with all our understandings, we maybe can get our arms around part of the problem. But none of us are, are so comprehensive that we control the information on a thing because the thing is so complex. Right. And so that's, totally. the, only, that's the only thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's always evolving. And that's what she always says. But what Scott ended up doing and why I kind of why I mean, I appreciate what he's done. And actually, there was a guy that was one of the advisors. Elaine has these advisors. And these are the people that go and do all her work all the way through. And, you know, for for the street explanation of things is, is what I'm giving right now, not the scientific like you guys. But basically, that's within her group of advisors, they all perform her work. And like the disciples, so to speak, and Scott and Sarah are those, you know, have gone through that process. And there was somebody before them, a homie of mine named Ian Davidson. He started a company called Biologic Crop Solutions that a lot of people use, but he ended up moving to Hawaii and getting into some other stuff. And uh, Scott and Sarah, when I met Scott, he was basically jumping on as an advisor and learning and doing and saying the stuff where Ian stopped his work and moved into something else. And that one of the examples is going from brewing compost teas to doing these extracts. Well, what Scott did and, and, and Sarah is they took her information and geeked out on it and went deep and deep into cannabis. You know, a lot of people kind of fuck with Scott sometimes going, do you grow and stuff? And yeah, I'm smoking some of his weed right now, but he's been on big facilities doing big work. And I've been to those. And even Kevin, you've recommended something to, uh, a farm to have me go check out and then after I do my work I recommend Scott and next thing you know the place is blowing up and so oh, yeah, at the end that. of the day yeah and so at the end of the day uh, what's happened and what Scott decided to do was create those events and we did them with Elaine because Elaine was kind of like you know <clears throat> something that really drove a lot of people to get in there but Scott's data that had been collected in cannabis was the real eye-opener and I remember the first one we did Elaine was at the edge of her seat, like, holy shit. By the third one, I don't know if she could handle the uh, spotlight that Scott was taking anymore. And she kind of started deteriorating those events. And then we had Kevin jump on with us. And we had some good ones after that. And then eventually, I'm no longer with the situation that we were doing to create those. And so subsequently, a lot of that has stopped. But the information was insane that was coming out of that stuff. And that's what I cleaned on to it was Elaine seated, but Scott and Sarah sprouted. And yeah. it was much easier for me to understand because I, I, I've read her papers or looked at some of her shit and I don't even know, I don't even speak that language. Yeah. Scott's well, that, well, that's what you said. Like I called you on the phone back in like 2013, trying to get some compost tea brewing products. And I got you on the phone and I was asking like really specific questions about Dr. Elaine 
and regards to my family's farm. And you're like, look, kid, if this is important to you, like you got to find this Dr. Lane woman and figure out what she's talking about. And then you, you must have had a bowl or two because you're like, look, man, all these cannabis people, they keep saying soil food web, but I don't know anybody that's measuring it like this woman is saying it, you know. And so if you like growing pot and you think you can swing a microscope, like get down. And I took that really seriously and I did do that. And I don't think the market at wide really understands the level of analysis that we can and have provide and aggregated and distilled down into really functional advice. And it's just, I think it's a symptom of the market's not quite ready yet still, you know, we, well, we were trying to take that to big ag too. And so I had already spent a shitload of time spraying walnuts with, with compost tea when, Oh, we needed to get it into the irrigation system. Spraying it was barely doing shit. And when you called me, you were like, yo, we're going to set up this thing and spray these fields or hay or whatever fields. And I was like, no, no, you got to drench that shit. That's what we did. uh, Yeah. yeah, And so basically it kind of evolved from, you know, like a lot evolved from there. But, you know, again, it was, you know, the comprehension of these things and the way that was laid out to us, everybody that I knew. And at that time was, we only sprayed compost tea, Mm -hmm. you know, you maybe put a little into the soil, but. Uh, it was a big spray thing at the time. Mm-hmm. Well, but what we did was we we did the data points. So both Sarah and I are capable of doing the full microscope process. And we showed up to a farm. That's exactly what we did. And to my knowledge, we're the first people to really provide that to the market. And we went crazy because both, you know, Sarah comes from medicine where lives are on the line. And if you don't document properly baselines, then, you know, a lot of problems come from that. And I had a construction business that had a lot of liability working in schools. So when we got into commercial cannabis officially, you know, the first thing we did was establish all those baselines so we could know where we're starting, so we can know where we're going. And what we ended up finding was, you know, one particular facility had like a perpetual harvest model. And we came in and took samples of each of the populations that were on this two week cycle. And we were able to drill down to a decision that was made by the cultivator that turned things into the direction of mold. And so as far as four years ago, we were able to come into a facility and within 48 hours, figure out the week that led to all the problems and what that decision was. And I just don't think people are still really ready to wrap their mind around that that's an analytical technique that can be executed and what they can learn from it. But you know, the people that have figured out how to use it, you know, back to square one of not saying anything about it. And so people don't know that it exists because the people that have used it most definitely don't champion it, you know? Well, and the thing that Elaine deals, deals with them more than anything else is that, you know, she came in um, where, you know, the papers didn't exist on any of this material, you know, like soil microbiology wasn't a common discussion. It certainly wasn't anything that was uh, able to be communicated to the point that you, you can have a conversation in an eight or six hour class in one day and give people right. more information than they had ever been exposed to in their entire life, right. you know, and they've been cultivating or farming for a real long time. So, you know, and she also comes from this point of, um, I really like Elaine. I think she's, she's phenomenal, just like everyone else has said, but you know, she, her position, at least originally um, was, you know, very defensive against, you know, traditional ag, you know, she has a lot of people that are trying to argue with her. She has issues with, you know, you know, grant money and, you know, who's funding the university that she was working for at the time and how all of that's like changed and modified in her life and how that's impacted and driven her to, you know, author over a hundred papers and really, you know, initiate the science in this realm in a a whole new way. And, you know, just like I had said earlier about the gut microbiology, this is something that we're going to be watching for, you know, decades to come. All of the different tiny little intricacies of how these um, microorganisms work together, how they work with the minerals, how it all like works with pH and gets into the plant and how all that can be very finicky, you know, especially with cannabis strain by strain or with different, um, different species of plants in general. This is just something that's going to be developing over time. And as we all know, you know, what works, what works for some person, you know, one guy doesn't work for the next one, you know, five miles down the road. And there's a series of reasons why that's the case. And so you just have to tune into your own, your own farm, what your, um, 
what you've got going on, what the benefits, you know, what the drawbacks are of your current situation and research it to the best of your ability. Cause that's the other thing too, is like we live in a culture where everybody just wants to look at something on Instagram instead of actually reading a paper. And then in the, if they actually do go read papers, they don't know how to determine whether or not this paper is sound, if it has, you know, if there's a large enough sample size, if there's any statistical relevance to what's being, what's being spouted at the end in a conclusion. And, you know, taking those jumping off points, um, you know, Elaine does really, you know, spectacular science, but taking the jumping off points that she's providing and the stuff that Scott's giving and putting it into practice in your own facility uh, to the best of your ability and, and coming out with something that was better than what you had started with before, you know, and I think that we're seeing that, in, you know, the quality of the material just increases day by day, which is great. <laughs> context is everything. Mm -hmm. it needs to be appropriate to your context, mm -hmm. what you're capable of. Yeah. So just quickly, I'm cognizant that it's 4.15 in the afternoon. Um, I had... <laughs> I, I, I had two more topics, but I don't know if you guys, basically the two topics were for Lydia soil biosolarization and then uh, the CDF, separate topic, CDFA uh, just dropped their proposed organic certification standards for the state of California. Um, do you guys want to, and, and then I had some viewer questions, but do you guys want to wrap or do you want to tackle one of those? I'm, I'm down for anything. I'm committed to finishing the process so all right maybe, um well maybe you want. Wh which one which one do you guys want to start with lydia do you want to do you want to introduce us to solar biosolarization well if we start with the ocal uh organic um regulations that came out then you can clip us on our commentary time <laughs> <laughs> and we can move into and move into the soil biosolarization, and it'll keep us at a because uh, I know that we could all wax poetic on our own personal thoughts um, about the fact that this is, this has come out. Um, so I would start there, and then I'm I'm ready to. All right, talk so about... let's do it. So uh, give me one second because I have to queue us up uh, to go faster, but. All right, so here we go. So we have, um, let me just make sure that I am, there we go. All right, so we have proposed regulations for certification of comparable to organic standards for cannabis in the state of California. Uh, anybody wanna give their, actually, Scott, I'd just like to start with you. <laughs> G give me your thoughts. So I read it before the podcast, and it seems very similar in nature to what we deal with in agriculture. Um, I guess to be clear and concise is, um, yeah, we work in the organic sector, but I'm not an advocate of organic certification. Um, you know, we've worked for large scale organic farms that use glyphosate right in front of us so casually, you know. So to me, I view it as... Um, uh, unnecessarily restrictive, which will keep you into a certain type of problem set. So I don't believe that it's not necessarily that beneficial. Um, it's, it's unnecessarily difficult to navigate as a farmer. And I think it's a far better goal that is community wide. We determine a new category that has merit with the, the public that we inform them on like living soil or like what Elaine is doing with biologically complete because you know, there's certain products that we use that are too much of a hassle to get organically certified because of intellectual property on how they're created and how the nutrients are chelated and they're perfectly fine, but because they're not stamped, you can't use them. But if you do use them, you don't have pest issues and don't need pesticides. So that's kind of the problem of it. Um, you know, I, I'm not a big advocate of the entire process personally. And I think it's better to just farm really respectably and don't worry about a label to confine yourself further to further regulation and, and um, scrutiny. You know, I was, I was excited to read it because, you know, you always want to see the positive, but you get to about page 30 of the 66 pages. And from that point to the end, it's punitive. It's, these are all the punishments and costs you will incur if you do not comply with this. And it was only like maybe 10 pages of material that directed you on what they wanted you to do. And then it really referred to addendum lists of, of licensed products that had been certified by somebody who paid to be able to be in that position. 
but it was the half of the document is punitive. And so I read it and I, I said to myself, I said, you know, I was going to go grab, uh, I wanted to go for this because I was like, hey, this would be beautiful. We can create this beautiful situation. It's accepted. People understand it. But as you go through it, you realize that it's, it's, it's another punishment and an extraction in pricing. And mm-hmm. so if you, if you start your certification program early, it's this much. But each year you go forward and wait to begin the program, it increases the cost of the actual program. So it's if you're not a first adopter, you're going to get taxed two or three years into it. And there was, there was costs on it that was confusing, but it was the, the lesser, the greater of $100 or 25% of your gross. And so... I'm trying to understand how they intend to extract the monies from you and how they will structure the fees. Mm -hmm. And it gets to the point where it started making me wonder, did I want to even go through it? Exactly. And I was somebody that was really like, Hey, you know, this is something that could be positive because it could give us some form of recognition in the, in the agricultural world as a clean product, because we have such a stigma, even though we're really the cleanest product in the market. Mm-hmm. which is the ironic part. Yep. Right. Well, being well, certified, does that mean you're not going to fail a test, though? I mean, you can be certified whatever and get a heavy metal fail. fucking still, or a drift have, fail. No and so then what? You know, and or is it going to cause, is it going to get more money? Because I don't know what certification has got fetched more money because the price of weed is the price of weed. You can add value. There's a story behind it. You can get more volume sold, maybe. But is any certification saying, okay, boom, now you get this much more money? Not yet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not yet. Well, and then, no well, st- so if you compare it to what's going on in the industry already with Dragonfly Earth Medicine doing the Dem Pure certification, mm-hmm. then you have EnviroCan, um, and then there's Clean Green. There's a Bronner. series of different certifications that are being offered. What's, what's um, Bronner's cert, Lydia? I'm sorry? What's Bronner's cert? Sun uh, and Earth. Sun and Earth. Yeah, that one as well. Exactly. And so there, there's multiple options for what's going on in the industry. Um, I really like Dragonfly Earth Medicine. The, the Kelly and Josh really have it together. Um, I really like everyone that runs with their crew, um, just as a personal aside. But, you know, you have people in the industry that have been in the industry for a long time that respect the plant that are here for, for reasons that, you know, go far beyond just trying to make a bunch of money and run a large uh, scale process, but you're going to be seeing our adopters of this, just like they're a biodynamic, you know, there's, there's uh, people that are doing organics, people that are doing biodynamics and, and regular, you know, the regular ag world. Um, and it's a small percentage even still. And so just like you guys are saying from a laboratory perspective, just because something's organic doesn't mean it passes, you know, people go through and they get organic products to make their edibles. Like I was mentioning earlier, and they can still fail the testing requirements that are, um, you know, that are put out and mandated by the state for uh, cannabis products to get to the market. So it's one of those things where I do think it's really important that if you have any interest in the game, you should definitely be looking at the OCAL proposed regs. You can make comments on it until July 7th, which I encourage anybody that has a commentary about that specific topic to please, you know, submit it because they, they really do seem to listen is what I've noticed in California. Um, but, you know, whether or not someone just decides to adopt that or not doesn't necessarily mean that their product is going to be better or worse than another person's. And then additionally, as we're watching the Appalachians project unfold, you know, that started years ago um, and they still haven't come into a, a reality with that yet. Um, you know, terroir and, you know, the amount of plants that are actually grown in native soil versus those that are not, which is, um, you know, a fairly large swing between the two. Um it's just something to really be considerate of, you know, again, like those organic certifications, they can cost hundreds to thousands of dollars, you know, the amount that they're going to be taking off your back end when we're already dealing with such difficult taxation issues in the cannabis industry anyway. Um, And whether or not that's right for somebody's business is a personal decision. But I do think that it's, it's interesting that after a couple of years, they finally came out with it. Um, I think the naming convention is pretty interesting that they're actually using the word, you know, um, <laughs> organic certification um, through the state of California's Department of Agriculture. And so I think that, you know, at least is within the realm of this conversation, it's going to be interesting to watch all of that come into reality, no matter what it looks like. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. I, yeah, one of the hydroponic facilities we work for has an employee that's a lobbyist and they're actually very active in the OCAL. And so I think what the organic people need to understand is that they need to be as active in their own certification as their opposers are. And I would start there. In real ag, it's mostly paperwork, though. It's not a lot of testing. I mean, they do check to see where you store all your shit. But I mean, my farm was certified organic. I went through the whole process as, uh, to do farmer's markets many years ago. And uh, it's just a big paperwork thing. You know, they come look at the farm and go right on. You know, but other than that, there's no soil testing that they did, at least, you know, through any of the processes I went through. So, I mean, <clears throat> it's watered down at the best. All right. So uh, have, we, have we covered the uh, organic certification standards for the CDFA? Yeah, I, I think Kevin had the best distinct description of the first three pages are definitions. There's nine pages of what to do, and then 33 pages of how much it's going to cost you and how much trouble you're going to be. Like, that, I think that tells you most of what you need to know right there. Okay, so just quickly, Lydia, do you have time to to give a a quick intro to solar by solarization? Yeah, I do. I have a I have a, I have a moment. Okay, so, so, so wait, before you go, before you start it, uh, let me cut to the one graphic I could pull up so people know what we're talking about. Is that, is that a reasonable graphic for what we're talking about? Look at those fun words, digestates and mesocosms. <laughs> See, yes, this is okay. So this is bad. This last image is real helpful. So basically the, the general process and thought that we're talking about here is um, the, the use of different types of um, plastics to cover up, um, to cover soil and heat it up to a certain temperature for a certain number of days that basically uh, thermally inactivates uh, weed seeds and pests and disease um, within a certain, you know, depth of the soil surface. And so um, we were chatting about this um, privately. Uh, one of our other um, IPM friends in the cannabis space had shared a slide from Jim Stapleton's work over at uh, UC Kearney Ag Research. And so basically, you know, this is a, a uh, a practice that you see implemented in like strawberry fields. So when you drive past a field and, and um, there are furrows and then in between the furrows, um, there are these sheets of plastic that are just covering like long, long rows um, in these big fields. Um, essentially the, the purpose and the point is to, like I said, like knock down anything that would be causing a uh, difficulty in managing pests or disease once the actual crop comes up. They they utilize this type of thing when it comes to managing um, spring mix, you know, like the greens, you know, there's a zero tolerance policy for having weeds in your spring mix crops, right? But you can't go through and hand weed, you know, acres and acres is exactly right, right there uh, that you just put up. Uh, you can't go um, hand weed acres of um, of spring mix is just something that's, you know, it's a limiting factor, the number of people that you're going to have to have do that, you know, the, their capacity to get it right every time, like it's, it's pretty intense. And so what's been going on with the biosolarization is essentially taking the soil solarization topic, you know, the whole background of heating up the soil to inactivate these, these things that you're not wanting in your, your system. And then the bio part is adding organic material into that heating process. And as the organic material decomposes, it, there are toxic breakdown products that eliminate soil pest organisms. Um, you know, we're talking about something that's as little as an addition of 5% of something like, uh, they, they tested tomato pumice, white wine, grape pumice, and red wine, grape pumice, uh, saying that the tomato byproducts from the traditional, you know, food ag was really helpful in eliminating some of these plant pathogens that they were concerned about. But, you know, as with everything, it does have limitations on its effectiveness. You know, you wouldn't want to complete the, this type of solarization and then move all, all of your soil or till it or, you know, get it all mixed up because you're only inoculating or you're only really uh, inactivating those first top inches, uh, you know, six inches ish of, um, of topsoil up top. And then the kind of the thought process is that the 
beneficial organisms, you know, earthworms and other, uh, you know, fungi, bacteria that, you know, they're used to a larger range and change in their environment. They're, they're much more like plastic and capable of, of managing environmental stress and change differently than perhaps disease uh, and pest organisms that are going to more similarly need uh, an environment that matches their host plant. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of information that UC Davis, UC Kearney has put up. Um, there's other scholarly papers that had put out, been put out about this. Um, you know, when I worked for BASF, we would put all of our, um, all of our media into this like deep, deep freezer and freeze everything for a, a period of time. And then have to take all of the big bales of material and let them thaw before we use them in the greenhouse um, for pesticide research. And so it kind of works on the polar opposite end is that if you create this like massive environmental change or temperature shock that you can reduce, you know, pathogens and pests and disease. And I bet that that Scott and Eric and Kevin and Sarah have all seen this employed, especially down in Salinas Valley uh, and other places where there's a lot of, a lot of crops and a lot of dirt instead of soil. For sure. There's a cannabis company that does like a whole steaming thing actually. And, and I don't know what they bring in to do it, but they tarp everything over and actually inject steam in there. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. This is where I really started to defer to what I learned from Dr. Lane and that like all the problems live in decreased oxygen conditions and all the good things live in the increased oxygen conditions. And there's like a gray area in the center. And, you know, I, I think what's been missing on the growing community at wide, whether it's big ag or the small cannabis farmer, is that, you know, there's aerobic strategies for dealing with problems. And I think that's something that Dr. Lane has discovered and communicated that hasn't really settled in with the market too much. Um, you know. But uh, this, it still wouldn't, this, this sounds like you're also dealing with weed seeds, which is a, mm -hmm. um, a pretty good strategy for dealing with that. Um, are they doing this in preparation then on these rows for, for doing yeah. this? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and the thought process is that uh, plant soil or the soil solarization can take four to six weeks, you know, at a certain temperature during the hottest part of the year, you have to have, you know, bright sun, really high temperatures for it to be effective. And, and what they're implementing the bio solarization is they're trying to reduce that time and then also reduce the temperature uh, window requirement. And so they're changing something that's like four to six weeks of, mm -hmm. of your um, your field being down, you know, not, not yeah. cultivating anything to making it, you know, seven to 10 days and achieving a similar effect, uh, without going anaerobic, like Scott mentioned, right. You don't want to like drench your soil and then put a bunch of plastic tarping on it and just hope right. for the best. Right. Like that's not the goal. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, but so it was just interesting. Peter brought it up. It sounds like that by adding, it sounds like what they're saying is by adding plant material, they shorten the duration of what's needed to be effective because they're composting in place essentially so by adding the grapes or the you know any of the agricultural crop residues you're adding organic matter that probably probably gets hotter quicker or something because it's composting i don't know yeah i'm a little unclear okay. how that process hmm. is totally hmm. you know layering if, out in the short if you chop time. your season up there's no benefit in that either Exactly. Yeah. So, so you must have to do it in a crop rotational form where you're doing grid A and then grid B is the one where you'll do solarization and, and then application of material to, to develop a uh, better tilth. And then, you know, you'll into, into mix it and then next year you would reverse it. So you're, you're taking like, you know, a hundred thousand square foot and you're only growing on 50,000. And so you do 50,000 this year, 50,000 next year, but this way that solarization would work in the hot part of the summer because how can you cut a chunk of the growing season out and get paid? Mm -hmm. It's a tough one. Yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, exactly. That's, that, that's the hard part is that it, it, some of this stuff is just tough for us with, because the benefit outdoor is doing it outdoor and catching the season. Yeah. You, you don't have anything but that window. Maybe, maybe this yeah, is- and the, and the, 
Sorry. I was going to say, maybe this oh. is a strategy for like, you're seeing a lot of hemp people move into old agricultural grounds. So maybe this is like a before we start strategy or something. Yeah, got like, like yeah. the three year fallow prior to organic. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. As long as yeah. it doesn't create any like yeah. disease, as long as it's, you know, the, the goal and the actual effect of it is to bring it down to something like neutral and you're not actually causing disease. I don't see a problem with it. It seems like it could fit somewhere. Um, you know, as long as I'm always mindful that whatever we do produces a solution has a it doesn't linger around for eons of generations and plastics and things mm -hmm. like that as we go forward. If we can come up with solutions that don't that biodegrade or whatever as they come into the environment. But um, but it sounds like to me that if you did bring it down to neutral in a strategy like this, you could easily then revive it with a good inoculum, mm -hmm. um, like with the compost and things like yeah, that. Yeah, and, and this is where like, you know, we spoke about some of the obstacles that, you know, maybe Elaine, Dr. Lane has, but like, this is where I put her as the undisputed world champion. Like yeah. we, we have yet to run into a facility that had a soil pathogen problem that we couldn't get under control in a reasonable right. amount of time with the same strategies that we use to increase yield. And that, that's where what Dr. Lane has not missed once, you know, yeah. um, you know, despite her views on mineral balancing or what she thinks is the correct goal. You know, when we take strategies and cultivation that lead to an aerobic root zone, we don't have those problems at all. Yeah. You know, I mean, I could see it being utilized as a first time strategy to implement in a field. Um, and then as you go forward. So the, the way that um, in soil ecology, as we deal with weeds, as we move along the ecological succession underground in the microbes. And so that's how we start just selecting for which plants then thrive in the system. But that's a much longer term strategy, depending on, you know, what your base soil is starting out with. So I could see this being something definitely utilized as a start of a system. Um, if your system is a young system, so let's say you're doing greens all the time and it doesn't take much to inoculate it every time. And you could do this every time because you're not growing trees that need a very long, you know, growth, ecological, ecological growth time to get that fungal component up. That's a, they have a much lower threshold of, of um, biological um, numbers that they need. So for, for something like greens, I could see that being a, a good strategy. Super effective, yeah. Yeah. And There's they're introducing this as a alternative to conventional fumigation, you know, fumigating your soil, yeah. which we all yeah, agree yeah. is not an methyl option bromide. for cannabis. Yeah. Yes. yes. Not a good idea. Yeah, methyl bromide. Yeah. Methyl bromide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's how they do organic walnuts because it takes four years before there's nuts. So they yeah. dig out the old tree, methyl bromide the whole plant, a new one. Oh. And then in four years when it produces, it can be deemed organic. Wow. wow. <laughs> yeah. There's no loophole though, you know? One of Dang the, shit. Yeah, one, one of the most profound moments in my entire, you know, growing career was I was at a greenhouse in Salinas and, uh, you know, the owner of the property also is growing strawberries and they brought in like a flat of clamshells of strawberries and all the weed, all the white weed people were just devouring down. But like not one of the non-English speaking agricultural workers would go anywhere near those strawberries. And I even kind of was like, you want some? And their face was like, that was a really, that was a really profound moment. Like they've been in the trenches. They know what goes down and which I think is the beauty of regulated cannabis right now. Like yeah. we're getting a real strong snapshot with um, major financial losses tied to the things that we regularly do in agriculture yep. um, that affect cat three testing, which I think is really the kind of poetic aspect mm -hmm. of cannabis is so good at bioremediating that it's like cleaning up the agriculture that's next door because of the contamination that's leading to a cat three failure and a loss of investment. So now there's a motivation to look at how toxic our farming is and how far that spreads away from the actual agricultural field. You know. He's remediating the cultivators too. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, so just quickly, uh, we'll end, Lydia, I know you got to get off. Gemma, come over here. Say hi to everyone. We'll, we'll end with one viewer question. Uh, Gemma, do you want to say hi? Hi. What, what have you been doing while we've been talking? Hi. No, what have you been doing? Hello. Hi. You've been watching what? TV. Yeah. I, yeah. TV. So it's my babysitter. All right. All right. So, so we got one, uh, Lydia, we'll let you go because I know Lydia has to leave. Uh, a viewer question. Let me cue it up. 
Gemma, you got to be quiet, though. Bye, Lydia. Good talking with you. Right. Maine, and I really appreciate you fielding questions like this. Uh, my question revolves around living soil and uh, decomposition rates and nutrient cycling from season to season in a greenhouse that is not climate controlled. All right, so what we have here is a couple grassroots fabric beds, living soil edition, um, equipped with blue mat, blue soak. And I built the soil that the intention was high porosity, um, good drainage, and getting away from the use of the unsustainable peat. And so what I did is I used a greater proportion of rice hulls in the soil. Um, and I would say outfitted it with a pro appropriate amount of uh, organic amendments. And my uh, plan was to uh, put around six inches or so of hard wood chip and then inoculate it with King's Trafaria mushroom spawn. And we have a nice thick mat here. And then I laid down my blue soak. Um, and everything did really well last season. And now going into this season, I was surprised in looking in a few spots that the rate of decomposition from what I'm used to inside in my living soil systems is far uh, lower. And so my main question is, what can I do in this bed to stimulate some rapid decomposition to ensure that I have enough nutrient cycling to provide my plants with what I need this year? Um, so if you have any um, suggestions, whether it be a more of inoculation of worms, as you can see, there's one slithering by right here. So they have survived the winter, but I figured that they would self-populate. Um, or maybe a sprouted seed tea or compost extract. Wondering what you guys would recommend. Appreciate it. Thanks in advance. Whew. All right, <laughs> Scott. I'm gonna let the wife get this one. All right, Sarah. Ooh. Do it, wife. You guys. So, <laughs> so, so that was that was a long time viewer, first time caller. Yeah, yeah, nice. long time viewer, first time. Professional. Welcome. Yeah, here's, here's a video that question. Was cool. Yeah, that was and solid. I like that. Yeah. yeah, I like uh -huh. it. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, um, I would say there's a couple of things off the bat that I would kind of steer on this is that um, anytime you're wanting to increase the nutrient cycling in a system, you need to quantify what you have first and what that balance looks like. So I would get it quantified because you don't really know what you got and where you need to um, address the issues or any changes until, until you take a look. So I would quantify that if you're serious about this. Um, the second thing is, is you want a natural decomposition in the system, a sort of natural steady decomposition in the system that is advantageous to growing a plant and not necessarily um, a compost site. So I would say that is steered by the amount of organic matter and the combination of organic matter in the system and on top of the system. Um, so first and foremost, if you're growing, if you're growing cannabis, if you're growing any cash crop, right, for, for, for money or whatever, you're doing this seriously, I, I would make sure that your organic matter and your um, rates of nutrient cycling are the first and foremost priority of the system. And that requires oxygenation of the system. And that means that the soil, you need to understand that the soil needs to respire. And for the soil to respire and breathe, it needs to be able to get access to that air. If it's smothered with any thick cake layers of anything, whether that be caked on new um, minerals that aren't are too much, you know, anything can be too much, it, it, you know, any organic material, any min mineral material can be too much if it's if it smothers that um, surface layer, even if it's roots growing in the surface layer. So you can have you can have a living mulch layer, a crop layer that is too much, that it's holding on to so much water that now you're getting gnats and now you're getting other things like that, that maybe you don't want to have to deal with in your system. So um, understanding that when you're dealing with a living soil system, you want that aerobic respiration in the system. So yes, you want organic matter and that can come in the form of roots. Make sure that they're not overwhelming your system. If you're getting too many gnats, thin that down. Make sure that your mulch layer is something that is not suffocating the system. Again, if you're having gnats, you're seeing that, that you're, you're accumulating water on the system. And don't try to emulate necessarily too much of a, a decomposition 
in in the soil per se leave that portion for composting on its on its own to, off to the side i would i would i would suggest so um those are the steps that i would immediately take is just um i get that he it sounds like he's in a colder climate and he's trying to buffer through when he didn't have the plants and that's fine just take off that huge mulch layer when you go to um, plant the plants and make sure that your soil can respire that it can breathe um, that you can kind of see here and there into the soil and see what is going on. Now, if you're in a hot climate and you want to mitigate um, water loss, you want to make sure that you have enough mulch layer that you do mitigate that that water loss. So um, it's just a everything is context and, and a balance, but keeping in mind that you want that aerobic um, microbial life doing those processes for you. That's what gives you all the nutrients in the form that you want them. That's what gives you all the enzymes. That's what gives you all of the um, hormones and different things like that, that the plant needs. And that's what engages the genetics of the plant to give it what it needs when it needs it. So, um, I mean, microbes aren't perfect. You do have to balance that with, you know, your mineral profile too, but anyway. I, I think what's and, important, oh, go ahead. Hmm. I was gonna say on, de on decomposition though, when if, if you're laying that much rice hull into a media and you're not putting in enough of a nitrogen source in order to go along with it, it's effectively drawing a, as a nutrient sink. That's right. Wouldn't that also slow down that decomposition process because yeah. you almost like whenever I've used rice hulls in a mix, mm -hmm. I compost it first and then add it. I don't add it mm -hmm. as an aeration component because for me, it's always been a nitrogen thief. That's right. Mm -hmm. So it ends up it ends up stealing my effective nitrogen in, in order to break down naturally under microbial level. That's right. And so yeah. he might have had enough to drive fertility, but he's not getting enough of biological activity in the way he needs to really do composting. Yeah. And mm -hmm. and I'm just curious to know from your opinion, you know, does that make sense? Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah. Which is what I was going to say is that the conditions are what's important for. You know, if there's no water out there, there's no organisms doing any decomposition right. um, at all because wherever the organisms are, whether it's under the snow layer or in the rainforest, they need ideal levels of moisture for those sets of organisms. Um, they need organisms that will operate within those temperatures. So if his bed doesn't have any organisms that are suitable to operating during those extreme cold, then nothing's gonna be happening anyways. Right. Um, you know, Dr. Lane did a bunch of research and her work found that some of the highest rates of decomposition happen under the snow layer during the winter. And what, what she um, supposes is happening is that where, the, where the, the snow meets the soil, it's not completely frozen and there's a little free water layer that is the ideal moisture percentage for organisms to perform decomposition activities. And so, I would start to look at the main differences between his indoor that's having high rates of decomposition and the outdoor that's not having high rates of decomposition. I would think one of the easy components is he's watering the indoor and he's not watering the outdoor because he's just letting it try to decompose. So if there's not adequate moisture in that compost pile, so to speak, then nothing's going to be happening. Mm -hmm. And then if there's too much of anything, you're suffocating it. And again, nothing's happening. So we need adequate and ideal aeration um, and levels of oxygen for rates of decomposition to happen. You need ideal levers of moisture for that decomposition to happen because they need to be awake and operating with certain amounts of water. And then you need the organisms that will function and operate under those conditions with which they're under. And you need, you need that, um, again, that, that, taking a look at what organisms are there are are the organisms even there to do the decomposition mm -hmm. um so you may be asking the system to do something that it can't really do at this stage in its evolution mm -hmm. so and he did ask about acceleration techniques and yeah if you add supplemental things that can encourage biology which will encourage decomposition uh, one of the things that he mentioned was the sprouted seed tea um, which is a very popular thing um, of all the things that collapse beneficial populations of organisms in the organic sector, I would say the sprouted CTs are the most effective and they're just as capable at completely wiping out soil organisms as an application of a systemic fungicide is. They have the same amount of 
um, drop out. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. People don't think about that, but an accelerant can also blow the head off. Yeah. So yeah, you can start your car with a little shot of ether into the air cleaner every day, but at some point the motor is going to blow up. And so, you know, if you do add anything to that mulch layer to accelerate decomposition, you have to also factor in that we're, most of us are way over applying things, which causes a actual destruction of the organism populations through overstimulation. So you need to not collapse it through overstimulation. It's like a boom bust effect mm -hmm. like in any ecological system. So like even if you have too many rabbits and now you're going to have a big proliferation of coyotes and whatever eats rabbits, then they're going to decimate the population. And then you'll have too many of the predators and that, that can go back and forth in extremes in the microbial community as well. Yeah. That's what he's talking 100%, 100%. about. hundred percent, hundred percent. And Scott, you had said something interesting about uh, what Elaine said about uh, snow and what happens underneath it. Now I know, so he uh, blue is growing in Maine, but he's growing in a greenhouse. So the snow, yes. there's not a layer of snow, but if you, if you didn't have that top, can you talk about what would happen with the snow and what goes on underneath? Well, and I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not necessarily advocating adding snow either. I just meant, I think what's important is I think what's important is that the snow is providing the ideal level of moisture on the soil surface where the decomposition is happening. And so if he harvested those plants and never added any more water in there, well, water, oxygen, and microbes are the three things that cause decomposition to happen. So without the water, it's not going to happen. Um, without the oxygen, it's not going to happen. Without the organisms, it's not going to happen. So. You know, whether he adds moisture out there, I, I think what he really needs personally is he needs to get a good foundational composting technique to get that um, aspect covered to where he is providing benefit to his farm in the off season. And, and just let the soil be soil. Don't try to force it into composting because by the time you plant again, you might still be composting. Uh, like Kevin said, you get too many rice holes, your carbon to nitrogen ratios off your composting is going to be ineffective and you're going to have problems. So I would say focus on getting a really healthy worm bin. You know, you don't need a ton of compost. Everybody's after like mounds and mounds of compost. Like Sarah and I take little tiny totes, like three cubic feet. So two soil bags of compost will treat 40,000 square feet of cannabis. Like you don't need, if it like has a worm, the right amount you know what I mean? Like bin in a Rubbermaid tote, that's enough compost to treat 40,000 square feet of plants. Yeah. You don't need a massive amount. What you need is a very healthy amount of compost. And you know. what we call, what we're trying to term um, biologically complete so that we did delineate and di differentiate between like municipal compost, mm -hmm. which is a very different thing than the type of compost we're talking about. So um, biologically complete just means it has, it's inoculum grade. It has all of those organisms we're talking about that are doing the job that he's asking um, the system to do. Yeah. So. All right. On that note, Gemma, do you want to close us out? Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. All right. Thanks, thanks everybody. Guys. And thank you, Gemma, for being so patient for almost yeah, thanks, three hours. Guys. Thanks, Peter. Right now. Good seeing you guys. Yeah, you too. And and we 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 got Chris Trump next week. So nice. Tune yes. in. You're gonna this see is KNF topics. Sharp. <laughs> All right. Bye, guys. I am stopping the recording and.